electronic uh, devices. Uh, with apologies from Gordon Dunn and Emma Rogan. Paul Frews joining us um, through the Starleaf facility and uh, Sinead Bradley is going to be joining us shortly as well. I'll ask the clerk just to indicate any members that have delegated their votes under the relevant standing order. Christine. Um, under standing order 1156, Gordon Dunn has delegated his vote to the chairperson, Paul Given, and Emma Rogan has delegated her vote to the deputy chairperson, Linda Dillon. Okay, thank you. Item two, then, is the draft uh, minutes of a meeting that was held on the 18th of uh, June. If members are content with a true reflection, unless there's any amendments needed, then we'll agree them and I'll sign them accordingly. Agreed. Um, matters arising. But, uh, one item. There's an updated summary of the written submissions that's been received on the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill, pages 10 to 36 of the meeting pack. Um, the additions have been marked in bold. They include Derry City and Strabane District Council, the Education Authority and the Safeguarding Board for Northern Ireland. Um, I've also received a, a late uh, email from an individual in respect of parental alienation and contact uh, denial and um, I'm asking that the committee would give consideration to how that can be addressed in the legislation. So the issue of parental alienation has also been raised by other organisations um, as well, and a number of other individuals have written to the committee uh, in respect of this. So there's a copy of the correspondence that I've received and will be circulated and included on uh, the list. And that individual's also indicated a willingness to meet, and so we'll consider that as part of the potential informal meeting for um, witnesses, if members are content. Okay, agreed. Uh, correspondence from the Attorney General. Uh, the Attorney General has written to clarify his response during the oral evidence session on the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill on the relevance of the Istanbul Convention and Clause 10. He also reiterates his view that uh, for the UK to ensure that it is in compliance with the requirement to claim at least some level of extra territorial jurisdiction, the surest way of doing so is through an act of Parliament, as this avoids any doubt over legislative uh, competence. So if members are content, um, we will um, refer the Attorney General's written submission on the bill, the Hansard of the oral evidence and his letter that we've now subsequently received to the Minister for Justice and request that she considers the issues of competence and responds formally to the committee on uh, the matter. Uh, I know she's made reference to this in the Assembly, um, but I think we need to um, more formally seek um, the Minister's advice on it. I'd also uh, suggest to the committee that we would request our, in, uh, our own uh, legal opinion on this matter, which we can get from the Assembly's own legal uh, people on it, because we, we want to make sure that we get it right in respect of this issue. So if members are content, we'll commission the Assembly's legal services to give us an opinion on this issue as well, and then we can come back to it in due course. Okay. Chair, would there be any, um, during that uh, discussion with the legal services here, that um, there would be a conversation had with the say, uh, Parliament advisor in Westminster, um, just for an update in, in terms of if that's their understanding as well? Because I know just from, from speaking to one of the parliamentary advisors in, in Westminster is that in theory an amendment would be possible, but whether or not it's needed, mm -hmm. I think we still need to clarify that, so just if there could be a conversation had with Westminster on that, and um, obviously if the Minister would be minded to ask for that. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy that we, we, we get the advice on this. We, we need to get, I suppose, our own advice from the Department and then the Assembly, um, and then when we consider that, you know, the next step on it would be, what do we do? Um, and, and that obviously would be, if an amendment is necessary, um, I suspect some people may take the view we get absolute clear advice to say it's not necessary, then why would you seek an amendment? Because it may well set a precedent, um, and that's always something I suppose to be alert to uh, in respect of, of asking Westminster to put through an amendment and uh, to copper fasten something that we're being advised is absolutely legal proof, um, and there's just a difference of opinion between what the outgoing Attorney General has said and what everybody else is saying. So. But I do think we need to explore all of this and, and make sure that we get it right, because I would hate a case to be taken and to be struck down on this issue as a result of uh, legal competence whenever there was an opportunity to 
to quote the Attorney General, make it bomb-proof by having a, an amendment passed through Westminster. Um, so I think we're right to, to tease this issue out further, um, and I'm happy that we do that, and then we can come back to it. Okay, item four then. Um, we'll allow Ashling just to, to come in. So this is the first evidence session today in terms of the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill. Um, the evidence session that we're taking is from Cara Friend, Here and I, and the Rainbow Project. So Ashling uh, Twomey, the advocacy officer in the Rainbow Project, is attending the meeting in person and will be taking her seat shortly. Um, and then we've got Danielle Roberts, who is the policy officer in Here and I, Amanda McGurk, um, the LBTI support officer. Um, and, Cara, and Cara Friend and Gavin Boyd, who is the policy and advocacy manager in the Rainbow Pre Project, are all joining us via the Starleaf uh, Broadcasting Services uh, in terms of providing oral evidence uh, to the committee. The written submission members for your own benefit are pages 38 uh, to 60 of the meeting pack. So can I formally uh, welcome Danielle, Amanda, Gavin and Ashling to the, to the meeting. Um, I'm hoping that the the broadcasting service um, is working successfully. I can see some folks in, on the screen there. And Ashley, you're very welcome to, to the meeting here in person. Thank you, Paul. As well. So just, just advise the meeting will report, be reported by Hansard. A transcript will then be published uh, on the committee web page in due course. So I think it's going to be Danielle, Amanda and Ashley that's going to give a brief outline on the key issues uh, in terms of the, the written submission and then we're going to get straight into to members' questions, which is often where we get to tease out some of the issues in more detail. So I think it's Danielle I'm going to invite first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Danielle. Can you hear me okay? It's kind of an obligatory question. Yes, we can, we can hear you loud and clear. Brilliant. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, so, yes, thank you, Chair and Committee, for the invitation today. And the provision of video link is much appreciated as uh, yeah we're in certainly yeah unprecedented times seems to be the phrase um i'm danielle roberts the policy officer from here and i uh, here and i is an organization that supports and advocates for lesbian and bisexual women and their families it's the only women focused lgbt organization in northern ireland as an lgbt women's organization we're part of the lgbt lgbt sector and the women's sector we contributed to the Women's Policy Group response, as well as the joint response with Cara Friend, who we have a joint gendered violence project with. I'm going to discuss some of our key asks in terms of high level policy and practice, as my colleagues who work directly with victims and survivors will deal with the lived reality. Firstly, we welcome the, uh, the consultation on the bill and the, uh, a lot of the provisions in it. There are some aspects that we are content with, namely the definition of the offence and the penalties. However, we note that any restorative justice must be victim-led. We welcome the use of gender-neutral language that elsewhere in the UK, domestic abuse legislation is accompanied by strategies to prevent violence against women and girls and an LGBT action plan. And we believe this should be replicated by the NI Assembly. We acknowledge that the majority of domestic abuse is perpetrated by men against women in ongoing or former intimate partner relationships. Nonetheless, there must be support for those who experience domestic abuse perpetrated by someone of the same gender, women against men, or outside of an intimate partner relationship, such as within a family setting. The use of targeted strategies can allow the varied experiences of domestic abuse to be tackled. We also have some concerns with other aspects of the bill, particularly the reasonableness defence. We recommend the removal of the reasonableness defence. We agree with the points made about misuse of the defence against disabled victims, those with mental ill health, people with substance misuse patterns, or children where the perpetrator has had an authoritative role over them, such as a parent, which I believe um, Waphne have raised with you in their evidence. We also raise the misuse of similar defence in the USA, known colloquially as gay panic or trans panic, where a perpetrator uses the victim's sexual orientation or gender identity as an excuse for their actions. We support calls for a domestic abuse commissioner, as in England and Wales. This rule provides someone to scrutinise the implementation of the legislation, as well as a conduit for those disproportionately impacted by domestic abuse to raise their particular needs with government. 
we know there are already several commissioners in Northern Ireland representing various marginalised groups, and there's a proven track record of the role of a commissioner in linking government with service delivery and those impacted. Turning to gaps in the legislation, we support our colleagues in Bacchany's recommendations for a review of the family court system and child contact, the introduction of stocking legislation, and the creation of bail and non strangulation offences. There's a committee to consider Women's Aid Federation's extensive submission on these topics. There also must be a review of the effectiveness of existing orders available. We've got the inclusion of domestic abuse protection notices and domestic abuse protection orders in the bill and required to be detailed women's policy group submission on those points. Most of our asks are beyond the wording of the legislation and rather on how the legislation is used in practice. Some of these issues are beyond the remit of the Justice Department, but we believe it's important to raise these issues and for action to be taken across departments. Current data monitoring is inadequate. While there is ongoing scoping work, which may lead to the gender of perpetrator and victim and sexual orientation being recorded by the PSNI, we ask this is implemented as soon as possible. Domestic abuse within LGBT relationships is often invisible as there is no robust data collection or monitoring. We also note there's an adequate recording of all Section 75 characteristics. We call for recording of all Section 75 characteristics as standard to inform support services. We highlight particular communities for targeted support. It also raises the issue of LGBT asylum seekers or those who are here on a spousal or family related visa who experience domestic abuse. We strongly discourage the sharing of any information between the criminal justice system dealing with domestic abuse and the immigration services. We defer to the expertise of Migrant Centre and I, who the committee will hear from in due course. There must be training across the criminal justice system for all levels on the needs of LGBT victim and survivors and the needs for other minority groups. Often public awareness campaigns focus on a woman victim and a man perpetrator in a heterosexual relationship. This is a barrier for LGBT people from not only reporting domestic abuse, but also from even recognising that their experience is domestic abuse. There should be targeted public awareness campaigns for marginalised groups. We ask for tailored LGBT support, including LGBT-specific refuge provision. There are examples of LGBT-specific provision in Great Britain, which are referenced in our written submission. Having explicit LGBT provision removes the barrier of fear of homophobia or transphobia for people seeking support. And my colleagues will talk about some of their experiences. There needs to be long-term housing support for victims and survivors of domestic abuse. Not just provision. The bill doesn't mention housing, and I understand it's a Department of Communities agreement. But we call for ring fenced funding for refuge provision and priority consideration for social housing and again refer to the Women's Policy Group detailed response on this point. We welcome the Domestic Abuse Bill as a first step, however it must be accompanied by action as outlined in our written response on the response of the Women's Policy Group. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, to give these opening remarks and uh, uh, answer any questions if you have. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Danielle. That was very helpful. Um, Amanda? Yes, thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, I would like to thank the committee for giving me the opportunity to address you today um, in relation to the Domestic Abuse Bill. My name is Amanda McGurk. I am the LBTI Support Officer um, in the LGBT sector. I work for two organisations, CARFRIEND, the LGBTQ+, Youth Organisation, and here and I, a place for lesbian and bisexual women and their families. Both of which are part of the women's sector and the LGBTQ plus sector. I, I have contributed to both the Women's Policy Group and the joint response from CARFRIEND and Here and I. Um, I'd first like to highlight some of the key asks and then give some insight into lived realities of LGBTQ plus victims and survivors that I have experienced working with. There are many areas of the proposed bill that um, we support as such the definition of the offence and penalties. We support the gender neutral language used in the bill, but ask that there is a mirror to the UK legislation where strat strategies to prevent violence against women and girls and an LGBT action plan are additional to it. We acknowledge that um, domestic abuse um, is recorded as being perpetrated by mainly recorded to be perpetrated by men against women, 
caregiver support must be made available for all victims and survivors, inclusive of those in same sex relationships and those whose abuse falls outside the intimate partner relationships, such as adult child to parent abuse and abuse by siblings. We've also concerns around the reasonable, reasonable defence and ask that this is removed. We welcome the calls for Commissioner and we will be campaigning for the Domestic Abuse Commissioner as they will be essential to scrutinise policy practice and legislation. Within my job, there has been to date very few referrals to the LGBTQ plus domestic violence project from non-LGBT organisations. For us, when clients access a service in the LGBT sector, um, they complete a health and wellbeing form. Mm -hmm. Many times, this is how we identify that a client has experienced death, domestic violence or abuse. Many of the individuals I work with have never realised that domestic abuse can happen in same sex relationships as they've only ever seen heteronormative campaigns, campaigns showing heterosexual couples. And where a male, the perpetrator is predominantly male and victim of female. This makes LGBTQ plus community and the issue of domestic violence within the LGBTQ plus community invisible. Campaigns should reflect the diversity of the society we live in. We no longer live in a society that is heterosexual, white or full of nuclear families and legislation should be written taking this into consideration. <clears throat> For all victims and survivors of domestic abuse, there are barriers to reporting and for, L for LGBTQ plus people, um, there are additional barriers for them reporting domestic abuse. One of these barriers is that not every LGBT person has disclosed their sexual orientation or gender identity to family and friends. Coming out for someone from the LGBTQ plus community can be a very difficult process and people often fear the reaction from their loved ones and friends and a lot of individuals have to consider the reaction of the people that they live with before they consider whether or not they can disclose their sexual orientation or gender identity. For young people, they often have to think, am I going to get thrown out of the house if I disclose my sexual orientation or gender identity? Many people simply cannot say the words, I'm gay. Um, this means that it's harder for someone to then disclose domestic abuse if no one knows their sexual orientation or gender identity. Other barriers that we face in the community um, is that the community is small, both Ashley from Rainbow Project, who you'll hear from soon, and myself, have instances where we've had a client contact us via telephone or by email, and we've said, come in and have a word with us, and they've, they've, they've told us that they can't access the LGBT centre because they're worried that they know someone who works there, or they know someone who's having counselling or accessing other services there, and they're afraid that other people will recognise them if they're not out um, with their sexual orientation, gender identity. Um, we've had to work on these by either going to meet the person outside the centre or working closely with other mainstream non-LGBT organisations who we both feel that are inclusive and that we have good relationships with. Um, historically, there's been a poor um, relationship between the LGBTQ plus community and the police, um, such as criminal prosecutions for being gay. And this often stops people coming forward to report domestic abuse to the PSNI. However, I, both Ashley from the Rainbow Project and myself have done a lot of good work with PSNI and the LGBT sector surrounding domestic violence. And we aim to, to develop these uh, relationships further. We would also ask for consideration to be given to an LGBT refuge for victims of domestic violence and abuse. There are no specific LGBTQ plus space, safe spaces for victims of domestic violence to access at present. We would like the provision of LGBTQ plus specific refuge spaces, such as those referred to in our written submission. This would give LGBTQ plus victims a safe space where they don't have to fear homophobia, biphobia or transphobia as these fears often prevent victims and survivors access an alternative housing. And 
Insofar as recording and re reporting, um, we have few statistics around the prevalence of domestic abuse within same-sex couples. The police have recorded 31,298 incidents between 2018 and 2019, but there has no, been no recording of sexual orientation or gender identity regarding any of these 31,298 incidents. Both myself and Ashing have worked together with PSNI and we have called for <clears throat> recording of all groups of Section 75 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998 to be recorded when police attend an incident. Victims and survivors cannot access help if no one signposts them to the appropriate services. This is why we have called for this. In Manchester, after a short pilot, implement, um, the police implemented the recording of sexual orientation and gender identity in the first year of records, they had 775 LGBTQ plus domestic abuse incidents. Um, PSNI have now said that they're planning to start recording all of Section 75 and we would like this to be um, um, implemented as soon as practically possible. I realise there's a lot of information to take on, however, um, I'm here to answer questions and my contact details are um, in the document provided if you'd like any further comments after today. Thank you very much. Okay, thank thank you very much, Amanda. And um, last but by no means least, <laughs> um, good morning, members. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to come and speak to you today. On behalf of the Rainbow Project, we welcome the publication of the draft domestic abuse legislation, and we welcome the call for evidence from the Justice Committee. We felt it was appropriate to use our time during the committee to highlight some of the real and lived experiences of domestic abuse for our community. For over 26 years, the Rainbow Project has been working to improve the physical, mental and emotional health and well-being of lesbian, gay, bisexual and trans people in Northern Ireland. LGBT people present with complex and often multi-layered issues to the Rainbow Project. These include issues in regards to their mental health, primary health care, housing, substance abuse, safety and violence. Over the last 10 years, the Rainbow Project Advocacy Project in support with the, uh, with the PSNI have developed a fully wrapped around service for victims of crime, where upon referral, the client is not only supported through the criminal justice service, but also receives assistance in regards to other aspects such as counselling, sexual health, housing and legal assistance. This support is also given to those who choose not to engage with the criminal justice service. When we talk about domestic abuse, we ask the, com the committee to broaden its thinking on the issue. It's difficult to estimate the levels of underreporting for domestic abuse for any or any crime type for LGBT people, but our own research has shown that over 56% of all crime for LGBT people is never reported either to the police or to ourselves as organisations. We know that over 31,000 incidences are reported to the police, but as of yet, we don't know how many identify as LGBT. We know that the police are currently scoping uh, the mechanism for recording all Section 75 characteristics in regards to domestic abuse, and we look forward to the publication of that information. And we work quite closely with the public protection branch in regards to creating safer pathways uh, for clients who identify as LGBT to come and access support through ourselves. LGBT individuals experience many unique forms of intimate par partner violence as well as distinctive barriers that, that forbid them from taking help or seeking help because of fear of discrimination or bias. Gay, bi and trans men experience unique forms of coercive control. We have seen male victims being controlled through their sexual orientation, their HIV status, their religious practice or even their gender identity. Trans men may be denied access to a medical assistance or treatment or hormones, or their abuser may convince them into not pursuing medical treatment. In addition, previous experience of harassment or hate crime or police poor conduct may make it unlikely for someone who has experienced domestic violence to seek support from the police or any other organisation. Like Amanda has pointed out, we work in close uh, work with the Public Protection Branch and we've effecti effectively lobbied them to start recording Section 75 and we look forward to that. I wanted to talk about one case that I've dealt with recently and I think it highlights just some of the gaps where people fall through the system. Uh, a gentleman, mid-30s, married, living in Northern Ireland. He's caught in a cycle of abuse. This has been going on for at least the two years that I've been working with them. 
We've put all the avenues in place for him, non-molestation orders, contact, contact with the police, involvement with the police. He's classed as high risk. He's been referred to Marac. Over the last number of years, the greatest, highest number of cases that they see in regards to LGBT have been gay men at the highest risk. He self-referred himself to Rainbow uh, and to myself after his partner attacked him and beat, beat him. He's scared for his life. I'm scared for his life. He has very little funds in order to seek accommodation elsewhere. He's estranged from friends and family. He moved over here from England. There's violence. There's coercive behaviour. Like I said, he's fully engaged with ourselves and with the PSNI. But he chooses to remain with his perpetrator because there's one thing that's stopping him. The fact that there is no safe space for him to go as a gay man, as a HIV positive man. He doesn't wish to take up a hostel accommodation, which is the only thing that would be open to him currently because he fears the intimidation or the abuse that he may suffer as a HIV uh, uh, and as a gay man. He's returned to the perpetrator because he feels that's the safest place. A case of better the devil you know. And this just highlights one of the many experiences where victims of domestic abuse fall through the cracks in our system. We've had trans clients who may identify as a trans woman or a trans man who don't think that they can approach women's aid or MAP or seek accommodation through a single sex uh, uh, hostel. They face uncertainty around accessing that. Previous experiences may lead to uh, fears of transphobia or bias. That's just one of the cases, and that's set against a backdrop of inaccurate, inaccurate targeted services here in Northern Ireland. Amanda and I, you know, are the only ones in a population across Northern Ireland that are supporting victims of LGBT. The statistics that we have put in our submission shows that it is very, very prevalent, if not more prevalent, within the LGBT community. But again, we are invisible when it comes to services. We're invisible when it comes to awareness campaigns. Um, so it's really just to highlight that with the committee. But again, None of the work in regards to the field of domestic abuse can be done in isolation and that is why our partnership working is so important to us because we are an underfunded sector. Uh, Amanda is the only funded uh, staff member in regards to female uh, uh, victims um, and that's why we work with the police, with Women's Aid, with the Belfast and Domestic Sexual uh, Violence Partnership uh, and the different statutory advisory panels to make sure that for those clients who need our assistance, who may not come to us directly, like Amanda said, there is fear because it is a small population here in Northern Ireland that we may know someone. And that we don't want that to be a, a block to, to people to access and support. So thank you very much for, for your attention and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Ashling. And I think your, your contribution helps in terms of whenever you, you speak about an individual case, yeah. because often as a committee we can get into the legislative text and written submissions um, and you very much brought it back to the reality. This is what people are having to deal with through that example, so you know, I appreciate you doing that and I know we'll be taking evidence from individual witnesses mm -hmm. in the next uh, number of weeks. and. Uh, That'll probably be a very difficult experience for committee members, but you're, you're hearing from this, as other groups are, mm -hmm. um, firsthand, and it's not a difficult thing to, to have to be involved in. So um, thank you for bringing back to the, the person in terms of that example that you've gave us. You. Um, I know Gavin hasn't had a chance yet, but I, we, we'll definitely give him his opportunity now when we, we come to, to some questions. Um, I'm, I'm keen to, to pick up, I suppose, on some of the areas that have been cited. I know um, in, in the Rainbow submission, uh, it mentioned about the need to include the domestic abuse and protection notices and orders in this bill. So I'll t to give Gavin an opportunity. Gavin, do you want to just elaborate in terms of that aspect of the submission as to, from your organisation's perspective, why you feel that it would be necessary to include these um, domestic abuse protection notices and orders in the bill? Well, 
Uh, sure, I, I think we would agree with most of the sector organizations who, who give submissions uh, along with this, and that to, to make sure that the bill is inclusive of the, the vast and varied experiences of victims, uh, and to make sure that the legislation is able to meet the needs of those victims, it should include as many of the kind of powers and procedures that are available to support them. And if we if we can include it in this bill, um, we, we, that would be something that you would welcome. I, I would say so, Chair. I mean, I think we're we're feeling very positive about the bill uh, as is. There are there are amendments that could be made that would make it just a little bit more effective uh, and enable more wraparound support uh, for victims and, and give the police and the courts the powers that they would need to be able to appropriately support and protect victims. Okay. Because um, I, I know that's an area that I think the committee is going to be keen to see if we, we can include that in. Um, and, and I'm struck by some of the comments from everyone that has made around the statistics not you know, showing the, the true reflection of what's going on. And we often know that unless you have that evidence base, you know, support then usually follows where you're able to present um, a case to government to, to get additional support and there's probably two aspects here one is what we can do in legislation and then you know um i pick up on the comment about the gender neutral aspect of the legislation but then needing to have tailored strategies so that the different elements of people that are involved in this can have that support structure so gavin if you want to just elaborate a little bit more about why you feel it would be helpful to have tailored strategies um uh, on this uh, in terms of your own organization's perspective and then also a little bit more commentary around how we could get statistics that reveal the the prevalence of this um that then can help make the case for for targeted support uh, yes sure uh, uh, absolutely in our submission we've talked about how over the course of the history of our organization the research that we've done on the experiences of lgbt people that most of the inequalities experienced by the population can be related back to isolation and invisibility. Um, unlike a lot of other minority populations, LGBT people tend to be the only person in their family who's LGBT. Um, that means that it's not something that they automatically share with their parents, not something that they automatically share with their siblings. And it's usually something that people come to terms with on their own during adolescence or, or, or childhood. And that's a really worrying experience for a lot of young people. The Department of Education's research on the experiences of LGBT young people in post-primary education finds some really stark inequalities that can be directly related back to the, the, the experiences of these children as feeling isolated, dealing with something that is quite uh, significant on their own. Um, and that's then compounded by a feeling of invisibility that they don't see themselves represented, for example, in the curriculum in terms of the relationships and sexuality education that young people learn in school, it tends to be delivered from a, a perspective of, of male and female relationships. And so it can actually be quite challenging for LGBT people or people in, in same gender relationships to know what the qualities of a good relationship are, to know what the qualities of an unhealthy relationship are. If the message that people learn about domestic abuse is that domestic abuse is violence committed only by men and only experienced by women, it can make it really difficult for a woman to understand that she's being abused by another woman or a man to understand that he's actually being abused by another man. Um, that's then compounded by, um, I would say, a, a fairly uniform failure across government to adequately measure the experiences of people with minority sexual orientations and minority genders. Um, because when research isn't conducted into the experiences of minority populations, when the experiences of minority populations aren't routinely monitored, um, that makes those experiences invisible to policymakers, to decision makers, and to people who implement policy decisions. Um, and that then causes a, a continuing cycle of invisibility, which means that the population is hidden, which means that decision makers aren't aware of their experiences, can't make decisions informed by those experiences, and can't divert resources to, to tackle those experiences. So I think one of the things that we would find beneficial arising from, from a bill, particularly around the discussions to be had around uh, the, um, the creation of a, a commissioner for domestic abuse, that a public authority with the Section 75 obligation to maintain adequate data sets on the different Section 75 characteristics would give a better picture 
of the, the varied experiences of domestic abuse uh, across different populations in Northern Ireland. Um, and that data can then be used by police uh, and by other agencies to, to better support those populations in order to encourage minority populations, LGBT populations to engage in, in, in reporting domestic abuse. It has to be explicitly communicated to them what domestic abuse means for them in their relationships. It needs to be explicitly communicated to them the kind of experience that they'll have when they report those, those experiences to the police. And as long as people only see messages about heterosexual relationships, LGBT people will internalize a message that the service is not for them. So I think there's there's lots of research from, from different jurisdictions around the world that show how tailoring specific messages to specific populations enables participation in services and removes barriers. We've seen it in sexual health, we've seen it in, in mental health, we've seen it in, in education and in policing more generally. And I think it's, it'll be an effective tool in domestic abuse to, to better understand the experience of this population and to encourage them to better participate in the criminal justice uh, services. Yeah, no, thank you, and, and it probably leads me on to just my last question I want to put to you then as well, that the evidence there that we've heard talked about for those that haven't come out, that haven't yet you know, identified um, as LGBT, that that then means you know, they don't want to come out at this stage, but if they're going to report domestic violence in the, in the case of a same-sex relationship, that that's creating a barrier. I'm trying to get in my own mind... What can you do to overcome that um, in, in terms of by way of services and, and even in this bill? You know, how, how, can, how can you address that? I think that the, the societal barriers to people being out about their sexual orientation or gender identity can't be entirely resolved by, by this piece of legislation, but actually should be more broadly tackled through a, like a cross-government strategy to better improve the overall experiences uh, of LGBT people in Northern Ireland. Domestic abuse doesn't exist uh, in a silo in and of itself. It is part and parcel of the, the totality of people's lives. And so if we want to improve the domestic abuse experiences of LGBT people in Northern Ireland, we have to improve their overall experiences of being LGBT in Northern Ireland. Um, so, for example, the draft sexual orientation strategy, um, certainly the draft that was proceeding through the old office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister did include actions around domestic abuse, community safety, engagement with the police, um, as well as tackling broader uh, inequalities. So I, I think you're, you're right in terms of this legislation can't possibly deal with the, the, the barriers that prevent people from being open about being LGBT in Northern Ireland. That's a societal problem which needs to be tackled uh, in a cross-departmental way by government. Um, but there are ways in which this legislation can better improve the experiences of people engaging with domestic abuse services by better capturing of data, mm. by tailoring messages to encourage their participation. But uh, without a kind of broader governmental strategy that's focused on improving uh, the lives of LGBT people, more broadly speaking, this will only go part of that way. Okay. Well, thank you. That, that's been helpful, Gavin. Um, Doug Beattie. Yeah, thanks, um, Chair. And, and Danielle, Amanda, um, Ashley, and, and Gavin, thank you for um, giving, giving us um, that, that brief. And the, uh, the, the written statement, which, uh, which I've got as well, which is really, really useful, um, because it becomes a great reference document whenever we look at it. And what I would like to do, if I can, I'm not sure who to direct these questions at, if I'm really honest with you, so I'm just going to fire them out. And I'm just trying to maybe just get, get some of your rationale behind something, just to try and give me a little bit more information. So um, one of the things that you have said is that we should remove um, the reasonable um, uh, excuse defence from the legislation uh, completely. Um, could you maybe just want to use, maybe give a, a bit more detail into that and the rationale behind it? I've got the, 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 the little paragraph that you've written about it, but, but maybe a little bit more depth in regards to that. I will, I will refer to my colleague Gavin on that one. Gavin, you're up. <laughs> uh, yeah, th thanks, Doug. I, I, I think that the... I think there's, there's a broad consensus across the organizations in, in the women's sector and in the LGBT sector that, that reasonableness can be a very broad term um, which can give license to abusive behaviors um, by justifying them uh, in, in different ways. 
Um, certainly concerned about the ability for disabled people to have their experiences wrapped up in a, in a reasonableness argument about their own protection. And that's often about defending the perpetrator rather than listening to the voice of the, of the victim. Um, certainly for, for LGBT people and particularly young LGBT people who might be living in homes with parents who are hostile to their sexual orientation or, or gender identity, I think it's reasonable that, 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 that we might have concerns that, that someone's perspective on, on their child's sexual orientation or gender um, could give them license to treat the child in an unacceptably abusive manner by using the defense that is reasonable for them because of some sense of fear or hostility they have about their, their sexual orientation or gender. I think if, if reasonableness is to continue to be in the legislation, it really has to be properly debated, the, the limits of reasonableness, how that should be tested, um, and, and certainly not just accepting the, the word of a perpetrator that what they've done is reasonable without it being appropriately tested. I, Gavin, I, I, yeah, I think you're right. I think the, the, the last part of your statement, there, uh, your answer there, were highlighted probably where, where I am, and that is the reasonableness needs to be tightened up, uh, you know, um, because I think there is grounds, and, and of course it can be abused, but I suppose we, we had the Attorney General in um, last week talking about this, uh, uh, and he sort of like tried to explain where reasonableness would be, would be, could be applied. You know, um, in in the terms of you know an eighteen year old living with their with their parents, um, who uh, because of her actions, because of who she's been mixing with, because of whatever she's been up to, um, ha has the the family card denied her, or the family refused to pay her mobile telephone, and she could see that as as a psychological harm or no harm, and that gives her the ability to um, to to put in a domestic charge against the family for that reason. So that would be a reasonable excuse. So I, I guess the point I'm making is, as opposed to excluding reasonableness, I, I think what we're probably saying is it probably needs to be tightened up. Does that make sense? It, it, it does, Doug. And, and I, I know that Danielle wants to comment on this as well, and so I'll defer to her in a second. But I, I would say when it comes to those maybe kind of cherry-picked examples, what I would say is that my tendency would generally to, to be to, to err on the side of protecting a victim. Certainly if a perpetrator feels that a conviction has been unreasonable, um, they would have the ability to challenge that and certainly use human rights legislation to, to you know, further their cause. Um, but I, I would certainly always attempt to err on the side of protecting vulnerable and particularly younger people um, and, and let courts get into the, the, the detail of whether or not a, a, a conviction is appropriate. So, so who else wanted to come in on that? Danielle. Danielle. Danielle? Yeah, Danielle. Thank you. Um, I agree with what, what Gavin has said, but I'd like to add that in particular in relation to victims and survivors of domestic abuse, um, they've been a lot of them consistently told that they're being unreasonable and um, they've been made to doubt their actions and to doubt their own um you know experience of reality um i'm not sure if gaslighting is a term that's come up in front of the committee before but um a, a common action of perpetrators is to to make people doubt their that they've actually experienced what they have experienced um so the risk of that being then used against um, vulnerable uh, victims and survivors who have exacerbated mental health issues because of the abuse they've gone through is it's it's too big a risk for me um, to allow this to go unchallenged. Um, and if the reasonableness defence is not removed, then it certainly needs to be a lot more explicit in in what it refers to. Um, if it is about things like like the example that, that you've raised about not having a phone bill paid um you know i feel like would the pps even take that yes no. so you know there, there's measures in um in the criminal justice system already um through deciding to take cases through sentencing guidelines i don't think we need an explicit reasonableness defense for this offense um because the, the risk for people who have suffered mental health issues um, to have that then turned and used against them, um, it's just it's too it's too big to allow this uh, reasonableness defence to be there. Um, 
I know reasonableness is a defense in a lot of crimes. We've seen it um, being misused as well in a lot of crimes. Um, if we consider um, rape cases, um, you know, the, the idea that somebody reasonably believed that consent existed, that's something that's being challenged um, recently and um, we might well see review of. So reasonableness is included as a defence for a lot of crimes, but it's also criticised as a defence for a lot of crimes. So I don't think we should specifically include reasonableness as a as a defence for um, perpetrators of domestic abuse or alleged perpetrators of domestic abuse. Um, and I, I don't think having it not explicitly spelled out in the legislation won't allow other people, won't allow um, those accused to raise reasonable a reasonable defence of crime. Danielle, Gavin, th thank you for that. I, I mean, it's, y your argument is compelling, um, uh, and that's exactly why we're, we're here, to, to scrutinise all of these things like this. So, so thank you for your answer. Um, I, strangely enough, I have, I have dozens of questions here. I'm going to have to cut some of them out or, 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 or to let other people in. But can I ask, Ashley, just while you're yes. sitting here, mm -hmm. could you just give me... Just, I, I understand when you talk about a refuge for LGBT people. I understand the reasons for it, but I, I can't visualise it. What are we talking about here? Well... Speaking from experience, uh, and, and given the, the current circumstances that, that we have seen, um, the, the gap for LGBT people in terms of safe spaces is, is a real issue here in Northern Ireland. Um, I've worked with a, a number of clients over the last couple of weeks who have been forced from their homes um, for uh, paramilitary harassment. Um, another case where a, a gentleman, uh, because of his HIV status, the only option that was available to them was to present themselves to the housing executive as homeless. That, that was the only thing. They, they had no recourse to, to friends, to family. Um, and the thought of going into a hostel with other possible perpetrators of violence, those who may have substance or alcohol misuse problems, um, is extremely, extremely stressful for them. So they're having to leave, possibly leave or flee a domestic abuse situation and go into a, a hostel where they are fearful of what could happen. And we know that there are issues in some hostels in regards to violence, sexual violence, uh, that, that has occurred. If you're someone who's vulnerable in a fragile state, leaving a highly emotive place, going into that type of space without the support, and also having to come out to the police in the first stage to actually say, I, this is who I am. That's a huge barrier for them to overtake and then to go into a property where they're fearful of homophobic, transphobic, biphobic abuse um, is, is too much for some of them to take. And really, we, we as a sector see cases on a regular basis uh, where people have had to flee their homes for various reasons. Domestic abuse, we've talked about young people. I had a 17 year old who was beaten and kicked out of their home because they came out to their, to their parents. And I think you know, it's, it's difficult. I think, I think there's definitely scope for us to look um, um, for um, an LGBT specific space or spaces that can be provided. I think it's a, it's a conversation that uh, the committee, the Department of Communities, I know I've spoken to the Minister of Justice and to the Minister for Communities as well about talking and trying to scope out an exercise in terms of forming a business plan uh, for that. Because certainly I know there are some clients that, that I'm working with right now and they will just not consider going into a hostel or a temporary accommodation. So, so, so yeah, so, so we're talking about an LGBT plus mm -hmm. specific refuge, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but then that would probably be Belfast-centric. Well, I mean, that, that's because a conversation, that's yeah. With, yeah. Uh, you know, the majority of cases that we do see are in the more densely populated areas, Belfast, Foyle, uh, and things like that, but certainly I think it's a conversation for outside of this legislation, but it's certainly, uh, this just highlights again the fact that there is a gap in the services to, to uh, both male victims and LGBT victims uh, of domestic abuse. And I think it's certainly something that uh, both departments should, should look uh, towards maybe scoping out. 
Actually, thank, thank you. And, okay. and more very brief question. And, and see if I can send this to Amanda, because um, I haven't heard from you, Amanda. <laughs> but, but I'm just I'm very conscious that transgender NI isn't here. And I, I raised it last week, and, uh, and I've spoken to them since, you know, because I think they have a very, very specific issue in regards to, to this as well. Um, could, could, can we get a sense of how things are within that community at the minute for those who are living within a household who are trying to go through um, that transition process. And please forgive me if I'm using the wrong terminology, but, but, I, but I guess you know what I mean. Yeah, well, I wouldn't be the expert, and it would be transgender and I that would be the expert on, on these things. Um, for transgender people or trans people who are living in a domestic um, abuse situation, um, it's very, very difficult for them to access help um, the, the refuges here um, don't actually have a, a policy on whether they accept trans women or not. So for the likes of myself and Ashley, do we or do we not send a trans woman to a refuge? We don't know because you would need to be making phone calls to check um, what that, that specific refuge thought on at that given time. Um, so I think that's an issue. Um, And I suppose from having spoken to different refuges, I think that there's some work being done on that now and they're in, in talks with um, Alexa from Transgender NI. And um, there's, there's little support for um, transgender people um, in domestic situations because, you know, <coughs> they're going through a completely different process where they're maybe uh, um, having treatment for hormones and, and, and such like um, and it's harder for them to um, not disclose their, their gender identity I'd like yeah, no, no, that, I mean, that's, that's perfect. I mean, I guess I was trying to get that sense of, of, of were we getting much about them being denied that hormones while they were in that and um, were they then reporting that as a domestic sort of situation? That, that, that's the sort of sense that I'm trying to, trying to get, if that, if that happens much or is reported much. Doug, can I, can I, sorry, yeah. sorry, Chair, if I can just come in. Um, trans people in Northern Ireland ex ex face extreme, uh, extreme pressures in regards to accessing healthcare. Um, our gender identity clinic hasn't taken on new clients since 2018. We as a sector are seeing a massive impact on the services that we provide in terms of counselling, advocacy support uh, and peer support from, from the trans community and we work quite closely with transgender and I in providing that support. But again, that raises an issue if you are a trans man um, um, who may have been, been raped um, and having to present yourself to, to the, PS, the PSNI and go through uh, that uh, reporting system, that can be very traumatic, very invasive questions about your body, uh, about the complexities around trans issues. So there are a whole uh, number of additional unique barriers uh, to someone who is experiencing domestic abuse. And like I said in my earlier statement, you know, trans clients can face that coercive control from an abuser in regards to how they dress, how they interact, the pronouns that are used, if they can access uh, medical treatment, um, if they have financial um, money to access that treatment privately, can they do so? So there are multi-layered um, um, issues when it comes to, to the trans community here and their experiences of domestic abuse. Thanks, Ashley. I mean, I, I, I met with Alexa last week to talk that, to talk that through, and probably it's expanding a little bit on this, you know, this is bigger, bigger issues. But th thank you, team, for that information. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you. Um, Linda? Thank you to all of you for your, for your presentations and... Um, some of the questions that I was going to ask have been covered, so I'm, I'm not going to go over those again. Just, I think it was Danielle had raised that there were examples um, in the US where the reasonableness clause was used, was that, or misused rather, against victims. And I suppose maybe I think we should try to, even as a committee, try to, to get a wee bit more information in relation to that. I think it might be useful for us. We have the bar council coming next week, and I think we should we should also ask them about the the reasonableness defence. Um, you know, it wasn't something that struck me when I first looked at the legislation, 
but after hearing from a number of groups, and probably most particularly yourselves this, this morning, um, I, I would have massive concerns around it now. So I would like to actually get a greater understanding, and, and particularly in terms to the, to the legal profession and what that would mean, because you're right, the Attorney General used the example of, of a young person, and that was a compelling enough argument too, because he said, you know, that parent could be arrested, and that's traumatic. It's not nice to be arrested whenever you haven't really done anything wrong. But what's more traumatic? You know, to be arrested, you haven't done anything wrong, you come out, you can tell your neighbours, my daughter, um, you know, behaved badly and that's it. Or to not be able to get access to services or to legislation that will actually deal with a very violent or aggressive or coercive partner. So I think that the, the, the stuff you've given us this morning certainly has given me food for thought. I mean, Doug has, has alluded to the same thing. So. I appreciate that. That's probably more of a comment than a question. It's just a thank you because it has sort of bottomed out some of that stuff for us. Um, the, the refuge spaces, then, as a, and you've, you've already said it, probably is more of a DFC issue, and I think that we we should defer to the DFC that we have. You know, this has been raised, and you've raised it with them yourself, so they're aware of it. For me, I'm probably even more concerned, and, and I understand what you're saying about not wanting to go to a hostel, but in fairness, most people don't want to, they're, they're, you know, most people who are directed or pointed in that direction who are homeless and are looking for temporary accommodation don't want to go to hostels. So, but I also get that, that people who ha are from this community have many more challenges and, and being in a hostel is going to be much more difficult. Mm -hmm. But I'm concerned even, the reason there are refuges for women and women's aid refuges is for the safety of that person. Is mm -hmm. is the person safe? Is the victim safe in a hostel? Mm -hmm. Because they don't have the type of protections that you would have in a refuge space. So I think that that's something that we need to look at and, and that probably DFC and even you know Justice along with DFC need to look at in, in relation mm -hmm. to that issue. I think it, it certainly would be a concern for me. Are they actually safe? Just a question around, um, you had said that PPS are going to start recording the stats. Is it, is it PSNA or PPS? P, uh, PS, uh, the, the, the Police Service of Northern Ireland, yeah. And I just think that maybe we should write to the Chief Constable and ask where that's at. You know, I believe that the, 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 that body of work is, is being undertaken. Like I said, we have good working relationships uh, with the Public Protection Branch uh, and with Paula Hillman, who, who's recently just left to join, join the Garda. So we have those good working relationships. We've been involved with the COVID-19 discussions around domestic abuse from a very early stage that was established by Anthony McNally. Um, so those conversations are ongoing. It, it's a sizable piece of work. Uh, for 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 uh, for them to undertake, uh, but again, it will just highlight, like the chair has said, you know, having those facts and figures uh, will assist us in directing services uh, to where where that's needed. Yeah, because that 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 would be my concern. It would be around that that gap in services, just in relation to the the protection notices and protection orders. Then this is something that I actually had raised before. I'm concerned that they're not in this bill. Do, would it be your view, I mean, this this can go to any, I know Gavin had already um, been asked about it and, and he might want to come in again, that's okay, whoever, whoever wants to respond to this, but it would be, would it be your view that the police will have, have their hands tied until they have those in place? Because I have raised also around the non-molestation orders, they don't, they're not, they don't work in the way in which we would like them to work. I have concerns around the cost to um, the working power who aren't in benefits and can't access legal aid and then how the how perpetrators can abuse the non mall system so they can have they can go back within a week or two and, and have that person back in court and then that's additional cost and additional stress and most victims get to a point where they just think just let it go you know there's, there's no point in this so i have concerns about those not being in would, would those concerns be similar for yourselves or do you have other issues around them not being included in this legislation? Uh, Vice Chair, I'll let Danielle speak to that, but I, I would agree with your concerns around the, the lack of implementation of, of orders that are already there, and, and I would agree with you that, that the more powers that the police and the courts have to protect victims 
in the earlier stages of the intervention that would be would be helpful. Well, Danielle would speak to more detail on that. Thanks, Captain. Um, yes, thanks for your uh, questions and comments. Um, on the, the the sort of panic defense that's been used for reasonableness, um, it's kind of it was used in the UK, but it's sort of fallen out of um, yeah of, of being used. It would have been known as the Portsmouth defense or the Guardsman's defense um in the uk so basically it's somebody finds out that their their partner is not the sexual orientation or gender identity that they thought they were or not maybe not even partnered person that they're currently seeing or uh, yeah, in, in your imagination um so then um that is used as you know that was it that was a red right the bill they just couldn't um couldn't um, control themselves and it's entirely reasonable that they reacted that way. So um, that's it's a defense that has been used in the UK but isn't currently used, which is welcome, um, but it has been used more recently in the US. Um, there are some links to um, academic articles on this in our our response from here in I and Car Friend and also the response from the Women's Policy Group, which goes into it in some detail. Um, so, yeah, it's it is something that we're seeing that has been used legally here, and we wouldn't want to see it becoming um, brought back. Um, in terms of the protection orders, um, they might be dealt with in the miscellaneous bill, but why wait? Um, those is our is our position. Um, so we would like to see the introduction of domestic abuse protection orders and uh, domestic abuse protection notices. Um, I agree with your comments already that um, the cost for, for getting non molestation orders is a huge barrier. Um, you know, we're, we're talking at the minute about things like um, you know, free school meals and the impact of austerity and um, the working poor and um, we know the majority of um, people who are single parents or who are um, claiming benefits are women and we know the majority of people in part-time work are women so um, and we also know the majority of people in single parents are women so we need um, we need orders to be accessible not just to people who can afford to pay for them but to everybody who needs them and at the minute that's not the case um in terms of um non molestation orders and the um the effectiveness of the orders has been questioned and again i'd refer to the women's aid response on on the effectiveness of the orders because they um are at the front line and are often with people in court um because we don't have ICVAs, which is another issue, um, often that falls to, to women's aid. So, um, yeah, that is something that the effectiveness of orders needs to be reviewed because legislation, it can't just be on paper. It has to be workable. Um, in terms of domestic abuse protection notices and protection orders, um, they allow for immediate action. Um, they allow for referrals to... Um, to support services, they allow for, for immediate protection from the alleged perpetrator. Um, and in cases where a victim may not pursue a prosecution, it gives them that immediate reflection period and um, breathing space to think about what they're going to do and to be safer while they're, while they're doing that. Um, so, as well in regard, I think, yes, the police, I think would like guidance and would like, uh, you know, I know this or order that sort of legitimizes any action that they take. Um, but uh, also the court fees that police are charged at the minute um, for orders should be abolished because um, having a, an application cost for these orders um, means then uh, police officers might be weighing up budgets and people's safety and really those things shouldn't be weighed against each other um, victim safety is, is paramount so um, the 
the cost for a plan for the basic plan for those orders should be removed and also if someone was to breach a domestic abuse protection order then um, we think that should be made a criminal offence to breach an order as well um, which would be a, a new criminal offence um, definitely not an expert on orders and notices and um, would strongly encourage um, a lot of attention to be paid to the Women's Aid submission. Um, I think that's all of your questions, but I would like to just make one more comment about the trans experience. Um, one of the issues is spousal veto over gender identity recognition. Uh, or gender recognition certificates at the minute, um, spouses can veto somebody's um, gender recognition legally. So um, that is a particular form of abuse that can be used uh, against trans people. Um, so we'd urge that spousal veto was, was removed um, as well in gender recognition, um, which is probably a Westminster issue more than more than one for yourselves, but it is a particular form of abuse that trans people can experience. So I think it's important that that's raised as well. And thank, you. thank you very much, Daniel. I appreciate that. Um, just a last couple of points in relation to the DPNs and DPOs. I think that it's something we should again ask the PSNA about because I think very often we do this, we put in place legislation, we don't give the PSNA the right tools, and then we're constantly getting complaints about the PSNA are not protecting us, they're not doing their job, they're working with the tools we've given them and we haven't given them the right tools. So I think that it's, it's, it's something that would be a concern for me and, and they probably would be best placed to know whether that's something that is really going to make a real difference to what they can do when they are called to a home or to an incident, whether it's going to help them to actually protect the the victim. So I, I just think, and, and if we could also just chair in relation to the other issue that was raised on, and it's not to do with the legislation but it's around the education piece because I'll be honest this morning has been an education for me and that's as somebody who would see themselves as being you know having some idea or having some knowledge so I think that we should as a, as a committee ask the the education committee maybe to, to look at what can be done in relation to this around if you're talking about campaigns because it's not just campaigns about domestic abuse it's it's educating about the healthy relationships and you asked her about how we can actually tackle the bigger issues and that's how we do it. It's education and education will actually deal with a lot of the difficulties and challenges in terms of even people coming out because if everybody is better educated it will be easier for them to come out. So I think that we just need to um, look, look at the bigger picture stuff but that's not for the, the legislative process to be fair but I think it will be it would be valuable to write to the Education Committee and ask what they're doing in relation to education around this issue. Rachel. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, everybody, for your presentation um, and for your submissions. They were very detailed and very helpful. Um, just want to comment on, on what Linda's just said there. Certainly, the healthy relationships is key to this. Um, for the future, um, for young people and for people being able to recognise of what's healthy and what's not. Um, and there is a massive job for, for our education committee but also our education minister to take that forward and I know that, that it will be subject to some debate and I would encourage everybody to get behind that um, and adequately reflecting all different types of relationships that we have in our society because it's not as you've said, um, the sort of man and woman with their 2.5 children, that's not what we have here. So um, certainly welcome all of, all of the points that you made. Um, I have a couple of questions for Rainbow Project and a couple of questions for Cara Friend here and I. Um, so in terms of the Rainbow Project, Ashing and Gavin, um, th and Ashing, thank you for that very um, heartfelt contribution um, using the example of that gentleman. Um, that was quite emotional. Um, but in turn, you'd mentioned about the use of HIV status as part of abuse. Um, and that hasn't come up in other submissions by other organisations, and I think it's obviously quite specific here. But do you think that the uh, course of control aspect of this bill covers medical abuse enough, or is there something that we need to uh, put in? Um, does, the, does the kind of definition you use cover that? Um, do you think, is it adequate? I'll refer to Gavin on this one. Yeah, it's, it's a very interesting uh, point, Rachel. And 
Certainly, I think that the, the language could be more specific around, I wouldn't necessarily try be so specific about like medical, but more about disclosures of private information, which are used to belittle, harass, or intimidate a person. I, I certainly think that the language around disclosure, because uh, certainly forms of, of abuse within intimate partner relationships experienced by LGBT people, the use of outing mm -hmm. uh, is, is a very particular kind of experience. One person in a relationship who's out has more power in the relationship than the person who isn't and the ability for that person for the, the perpetrator to, to out someone or to threaten to out someone to their family to their their community to their employer that's that is a form of, of course of control in and of itself so I, I i wouldn't have any issue with the language um being tightened up to specifically refer to um, disclosure of, of information with the intent to intimidate or control. I don't think it needs to go down to the level of specificity around medical disclosure. Okay, thank you. Um, Gavin, and I suppose um, just stemming on from what Danielle had said about why wait um, for further legislation, I know there's been um, a number of, of statements made in, um, from organisations about what's not in this bill, including stalking and strangulation. Um, and it's been something that's been brought up as missing. Um, so would you support the inclusion of this in this legislation now in order to try and protect until further legislation is in place? And also, I'm just wondering from all of you, are your organisations part of the group um, discussing fatal and non-fatal strangulations with the department? For the Rainbow Project? Um, certainly with regard to the additional offences, we would have no objection to a more complete uh, suite of of offences included within the bill to tackle those issues around strangulation, stalking. Um, it really should be a, a holistic uh, package to deal with the, the vast experiences of people within abusive relationships. Okay. And uh, with regard to the DOJ group, uh, I, I'm not sure if Ashton is a member of that group or I not. I, I can't recall. Okay. No, I don't. Th I, don't I don't think, think so, so, actually, Rachel. Okay, thank you. you know, it's just been brought up um, by the department that there and by other organisations that there is a group discussing um, not fatal and non-fatal strangulation, and some organisations had said, you know, we'll wait until that's been um, that's sort of been worked through. Um, so it's certainly I would like to confirm with the department if that's something that um, you could be a part of a conversation um, and, and get a more, as you say, holistic. View of, of what's going on. Um, so, in terms of car friend and here and I, a number of my questions have already been answered um, about the reasonableness, and it's something um, that I share concern of, um, and that we need to be looking at the protecting the victim rather than the perpetrator. Um, and I do think it needs to be tightened. Um, but in terms of, and I've asked everybody this so far, but in terms of abuse that takes place on digital platforms. I know that online abuse and um, using non-verbal is kind of is non-verbal is covered in here, but in terms of social media and online, is this something that yourselves um, have experience of working with victims, and is this a big a big issue with with victims that are coming to you? And do you think that this legislation covers this enough? And I suppose that's kind of for everybody, but Danielle and uh, Amanda, maybe if you want to take those first. Um, I'll go ahead. So yeah, digital abuse is something that has been um, coming up more and more um, recently and there are so many different platforms in which the digital abuse can be used. Um, you're talking about stalking legislation there, you know, your telephone can be used to stalk you. you there are so many apps that have maps on them, your location services on your telephone. Um, I actually had uh, a lady who came to me and um, had broken up with their partner had an on-mall lesbian um, out against them and um, everywhere she went he, they, they appeared um, so was going to her sister's house or to a friend's house and the ex-partner would appear and um, she couldn't understand how this was happening um, and when I spoke to her I said listen you know there are all these apps on your phones that you need to be checking that there's no location, location services switched on um, and, and such things so um, when she went home she found out that the partner had been or the ex-partner had been following her around using one of the children's telephones was able to 
um, because the location services have been switched on on, on the child's phone. Um, so there are really, really, really um, a lot of issues coming through with that. Um, there's so much digital stuff um, that you can use. People have um, cameras at home where perpetrators abuse and the partner from work saying, you left the house at this time, you should have been back by this time, what took you the extra five minutes? Um, using pictures that have been taken, um, intimate pictures and, and threatening to put them online. Um, changing, um, I suppose as partners, we tend to share passwords um, for Facebook and um, getting into the computer and such with, with our significant other half, which is fine when you're in a relationship. When, when the relationship breaks down and the perpetrator um, wants to further abuse you, they, they, they can use your passwords. Um, there was a case recently where a young girl um, woke up one morning to find um, interim pictures of people being put on her own Facebook by her ex-partner and whenever um, she went to take them down all her passwords had been changed and she couldn't get into her own Facebook because she had shared her passwords with her previous partner before they broke up and they had went in after they broke up and changed them all so that she couldn't access her own Facebook. And the pictures were taken down but it took an awful long time for that ha to happen and the damage had been done by then everybody had seen all these intimate pictures. So yes we are seeing a lot more of it. Um, and I suppose the legislation goes so far, but I think it can always be tighter. And um, I think it's something that needs to be continually looked at with the development of um, technology um, being so rapid that we need to keep legislation up with it. Yeah, I, I, it's something that I see quite frequently with clients who are experiencing harassment or abuse. Um, our digital lives are ever expanding and unfortunately with the best will in the world, um, legislation and policing and criminal justice has not been able to keep up at pace with what, what is happening. I have cases where, where gentlemen have maybe shared intimate pictures with someone else um, uh, that they've been in a relationship with. When that relationship has then broken down, those images have been circulated to others um, as a form of what we would call sort of revenge porn or uh, sex sort, um, exploitation through, through that. Uh, so that is something that we're seeing. Again, Amanda has picked up on the points of electronic stalking. We, we carry ar around a phone in our pockets that contains so much information in regards to our locations, our times, and our frequently used um, locations as well. So it's extremely useful for someone who wishes to abuse to access that information. Uh, so it is something that, that we're seeing. Unfortunately, we don't have all the legislation in place, even for the police to take action against them, to take action against our social media providers, to remove imagery um, from, from their sites uh, and deal with those who, who are creating fake profiles in order to abuse and harass uh, previous intimate partners or uh, family members. I've seen it with, with young children uh, where intimate photographs have been shared between, between them and then circulated at school as a form of abuse, bullying, harassment. Um, again, there's a huge body of work in terms of online safety uh, and awareness and raising, uh, uh, raising those, those issues um, in regards to how to protect yourself online. And when things do occur, that steps can be taken. Uh, and the quicker that, that we're made aware of it, the quicker that we can deal with it uh, and try to remove that, that, that element. Great. That's all from me. Rachel, if I could just yeah. maybe add in just a, a, a short point on that, and, and I think it's a really important conversation, and actually with the, the progress of this bill, a timely conversation in that the legislative review of, of hate crime uh, for Northern Ireland is, is ongoing, and, and certainly Judge Marin in, in his considerations of, of that um, did ask about whether or not the malicious communications order should be adapted mm -hmm. to, to deal with online behaviour, <laughs> and certainly we would see overlaps between uh, domestic abuse um, and, and, and hate crimes. 
Um, and I, I think that there's scope for those two issues to be looked together. Uh, and certainly if that's not something for, for this legislation, certainly something to be considered in any uh, recommendations for legislative reform that are arising from that review. Thank you. And Danielle, I think you've indicated you want to come in. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, so first of all, here and I aren't part of the group looking at fatal and um, non-bank fatal strangulation offences. Um, any, anything we've learnt about that has been through our colleagues at uh, Women's Aid and it's very appreciated. They do keep us in the loop. Um, I think this bill could be used as uh, a way to create a specific criminal for fatal and fatal strangulation offences. Um, I don't know whether it's the best way, but um, you know, provided provided there was a commitment that um, there was going to be work done on on this matter, then you know, might be content to leave it. Um, but if it could be included, then I think this could be this legislation could be the, the body of work to do it in, um, in terms of uh, the strangulation offence. Um, stalking overlaps with domestic abuse, but isn't always connected to domestic abuse. So I don't know whether um, incorporating it into this piece of legislation would be the right approach. And I know work has already started on stalking legislation within the department. So um, yeah, provided provided there's commitment that that work is, is coming, um, I think stalking could be kept separate as its own bill. Um, Online abuse isn't adequately covered in any legislation. Gavin's mentioned hate crime, um, and in our submission to the hate crime review, we also raised issues of, of online um, abuse and harassment and hate crimes. So definitely that is something that needs to look at, but it's not solely a domestic abuse issue. So um, I think that's a, a larger piece of work um, that, yeah, that does need tackled um, and things like revenge porn, um, you know, we're that's one of the other issues we're out of step with the rest of the UK on, and it's it's not adequately um, able to be prosecuted. Um, you know, we're, and there's a lot of technologies that we haven't kept up with. Um, for example, the the recent upskirting case, um, where things have to be um prosecuted under you know, um like public obscenity or something something like that. You know, they had to shoehorn the offence into an existing legislation because there isn't any um, um, legislation to deal with, with how technology has moved on. I think that's a bigger issue and is definitely something that needs to be looked at, um, but it's not solely confined to um, domestic abuse, although there will be that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Danielle. Paul Frew. Uh, just on that final point, because that is a very important point about upskirting from Danielle. Uh, I think the the, uh, the perpetrators were convicted of loud conduct or something of that nature, and the, with that, it's the it's society, it's the population who are the victims. It's not actually the victim of the upskirting offence. Uh, so I, th that's something I have looked at, but I don't think it fits in this bill, unfortunately. But but there may well be scope. Uh, coming with regards to miscellaneous uh, bill or even the stalking piece of legislation so i'm keeping my keeping my thoughts on that and and keeping looking at that very closely this is a point for amanda and danielle although rainbow do cover this too but maybe just not strongly i want to talk which has been talked about a lot in this session about the reasonable defense uh, and and can i just say thank you very much for your uh, attendance today because it's been very informative um, but on the reasonable defence, I worry that to exclude it completely or take it away from the bill completely, we could be potentially doing a lot of damage for people who care for people. Uh, and the Attorney General cited uh, the reason um, about the child, the unruly child, and a parent trying to prevent that child from getting into harm. Uh, I have a case, a personal case, uh, a horrific one, and, and it you know, I want to illustrate it because it, to me it is powerful, whereby an elderly mother tried to protect a son who was severely mental Ill, mentally ill 
And he wrapped himself up in a rug and set himself on fire and put himself up against the door that could only open one way. And so the mother had to physically uh, get into that room and then physically manhandle him to save his life or save him getting uh, severely burnt. The same person tried to jump out a window, a two-story window. Uh, in both those occasions, complaints went into the police from the son against his mother. Uh, so I do believe that we need some reasonableness defence, but I do think it needs tightened up. But on the, uh, my specific question is this. On the wording uh, of the clause at the present time, which probably needs to be tighter, but it does then allude us to section one, I think it is, with regards to the descriptors of the offence and the offences and the activities conducted. Uh, where do you see, where, where do you see, have you got examples of where it could be tightened? Have you wording of where it could be tightened? Is that the Gavin then, um, Paul, or maybe Gavin, you want to pick up on that for us? It's probably for everyone, but, but certainly if anyone wants to pick it up. I mean, I, 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 I apologize. I wouldn't have examples of, of wording that I would use. Um, I, I, I suppose I would go back to Danielle's point um, about, yes, people are, are free to report uh, allegations of crimes to the police and, and police have, have obligations to investigate the crime, whether or not the police actually detect uh, the potential for a criminal offense to have been occurred is, is one matter whether or not the PPS would decide that it has met an evidential test or that there's sufficient public interest in, in advancing a prosecution is another level. So, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't be as, as distressing as it is for someone in the care of their child to be questioned by the police, potentially arrested by the police. Um, I don't believe that in those extreme examples that they would lead to a conviction um uh, and certainly not a conviction that would be safe from from appeal um so i i i would take danielle's point that i i'm as distressing as those individual experiences are the overarching concern that we would have would be for the um victims in less clear-cut uh cases than the one that you had had referred to there can i ask then on the uh and this is probably for Daniel and Amanda because it's in their submission. Uh, you talk about the cases in uh, the examples in America and the USA um, whereby a violent act was committed upon learning that someone was, was gay. Uh, do you think that, that here with the law that we have presently, that that, that would be used as... Now, again, when you're up in a court of law, you are entitled to a defence uh, and that barrister and solicitor is there to, to represent you and to help you fight a case uh, and that's just the way our law is structured but do, do you think that it is I certainly don't think it's reasonable for anyone to be attacked physically or violently because they were gay but do you think that that could be used in Northern Ireland? for this legislation and is there not other legislation other laws that that will be picked up before the domestic violence legislation will be picked up if someone is violently attacked even by a partner or in their home like a like comment like, like assault even or actual bodily harm or physical harm danielle do you want to come in on that so um, first of all, for clarity, the reason I mentioned Upsburton was just as an example of um, law not keeping up with technology. Yeah. Um, I understand yeah. that's agreement with this, but um, so well, that defence has been used previously in the UK. Um, but as I said, it has it has fallen um, it is, it is old as such. Um, so there would be a chance that it could come back, and also. Yes, other uh, other criminal um, offences could be used, but at the minute, it's other criminal offences that are used for domestic abuse. We don't have a domestic abuse offence at the mm -hmm. minute. It is assault that is being used, um, or 
grievous bodily harm or um, the other the other violent offences. Um, so we are using we're using other criminal offences that don't adequately fit domestic abuse, and that's why there's been a campaign mm -hmm. for domestic offence, and why I believe this bill is is being addressed. So um, we could be talking about somebody who finds out that somebody has a previous history of um, you know, if, if they have um, not come out as, as trans to their partner and then do come out. Um, they also have high levels of um, high levels of domestic abuse experienced by bisexual women in particular. Um, so bisexual women quite often um, and bisexual men are sort of perceived to be the sexual orientation of their, their current partner rather than um, being bisexual as a, a sexual orientation itself. So then if that partner was then to discover that the, the person had previously had relationships with somebody of a different gender, that can be um, something that can lead to an angry outburst or can be used against the person. Um, so I think it needs to be considered in this particular um, bill because so, relying on other offences isn't good enough. Um, so, so, yeah. so, so can I ask then, in, this, in the example you cite where someone at the partner feels frustrated, betrayed, hurt, and commits a violent act in that one occasion, that this domestic violence bill is about, uh, in most cases, an accumulative effect where there's a practice has developed over many weeks, months, and years. Uh, do you still think in that one example where someone feels betrayed, hurt, uh, and, and whilst there's no excuse for violent behaviour, absolutely not, but that, that example speaks to me as a one-off. Now, if it becomes a habit, if it becomes an abusive partnership, then certainly that's a different matter and it should be covered with this legislation. But a one-off violent act of uh, because someone feels betrayed or hurt, surely surely that's assault and should be best placed for assault rather than invoking this legislation. Uh, Am I reading... That would be for the PPS or the to decide um or yes. the, to decide which which offence is most appropriate to to charge with or to prosecute under. Um, I don't think that there needs to be a, a threshold of a number of offences or for something to be domestic abuse. Um, I don't think it needs to be. You know, there's not a there's not a checklist of. You know, how many times or how long it's happened. Um, I think corporate and anything like that would be would be dangerous and would would lead to fewer prosecutions. Um, we know that in general, it takes people three attempts to leave their, their on average, at least. Um, so perhaps a one-off incident is going to be the minority of what we're talking about when we talk about domestic abuse but yeah. it might be that there's you know, domestic abuse isn't just physical it's it's emotional and psychological and controlling behavior and financial control so it could be that there is one violent incident along with a pattern of controlling behavior or other emotional um abuse so there's the potential then that you know, the domestic abuse bill will catch both forms of abuse or all forms of abuse, not just the violent mm -hmm. act. And the people can be trialed or can be charged with more than one offence. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I, I don't know if, if restricting it is the is the way to go. Um I think having different avenues for um the, the PSNI and the PPS to decide um what's most appropriate is is better. Yeah, and I suppose I'm not trying, I, I wouldn't be trying to restrict it. I would just be trying to see the justification for removing the reasonableness clause within this particular bill. Can I ask my final question just out of those defences that were used in the UK around the reasonable defences because someone discovered that someone was gay or transsexual, um, how many of those defences were successful? Do we know? 
um, I don't know that offhand, but there are some some articles uh, linked in the response that would um, have that information, or it's certainly something I can look into and get back at a later date. Yeah, I think I think it would be worth chair looking at the research from America. Although I understand that the law, the way the law works, it will be different from state to state, and also from what it is here. But also, I think we should look to the UK also with regards to the reasonable clauses and the. I think that would be very useful to have. Thank you very much, Danielle, and thank you very much, Amanda and Gavin and Ashley there in the in the in the room itself. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, there's no other members that are indicating, um, and we've we've covered a very large uh, amount of ground in terms of the areas that we've considered. And uh, I want to just put on record again my appreciation to um, Gavin, Danielle, Amanda, and to Ashley for. Uh, making yourselves available to the committee. It's been very helpful and be assured that um, all of the areas raised will be properly considered by the committee. And uh, if there's any issues that, that we'll want to, to follow up with you as on, we, we, will, we will do that in, in due course. So thank you very much on behalf of the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. OK, members. Um, I want to move to the, the next evidence session, and I suppose it's timely just to make a, a, a broader point uh, in terms of some of the areas that we're covering, and it's right that we cover it, um, won't be dealt with in terms of some of the legislation, some of it, it may well be, and I, I just took a note, we, we, we touched on things like you know, upskirting, we touched on education, housing has been a theme that's been coming up, um, and you know, that's going to be an area that you know, we're going to get some advice on because the scope of this bill is unlikely to allow specific amendments in terms of housing, but even in the last evidence session we talked about refuge centres um, as well, uh, and then wider executive approach to these issues. So usually, from my experience in the past, what a committee would have done in, in considering all of the evidence we consider all of that evidence where it relates specifically to our legislation, the likes of the PSNI, um, in terms of the, the DAPOs and, and, and that. We can do that now, following this committee meeting. And where there's other broader points, we pull together at the end of the consideration process um, of taking in evidence. Here is the broad areas that everyone has raised. And we'll break that down to go, there was a theme that came out about education. There was a theme about housing, and then in the committee report, we can then the committee then summarise those issues, and then we have written to the minister for education, the executive office, you know, where it doesn't relate specifically to this. So it's more just to bear in mind that some things about raising that we write now to, we'll collect all of that, and then the committee will pull together and we'll break it down, and then there'll be strands of work that will flow from that. So it's more just to try and, and guide members as to the process in respect of that. Can I just, on that chair, and I'm just to say I'm very content with that approach, I, I just don't want stuff that is, is raised in the committee to be lost, go yeah. out their end of the ether and, and be lost. So, well, and I'm, I'm more than happy because we'll have more than enough to do no, I think the legislation. I think we're members, think. as you've done, rightly flag up, here's something that needs to be looked at. It lets us know, as we're push, pulling it all together and, and those consideration points, you know, that members have flagged these up as issues that we wanted to come back to. Um, so it, it's worth doing that to say that's something that I would like for the committee to look at on the, as a result of what has been said in the evidence session. So do that um, by all means, because that, that will be helpful. But in terms of executing a kind of a work stream out of it, we'll, we'll have a sitting where we can look at all of that as part of the committee report. And, and we, we will then, I suspect, on the back of this, have quite a lot of different work strands going out to different departments. Some of, I was going to say, some of it won't, probably won't be a work stream for us at all. It's more about highlighting it to other yeah. departments, to be, to be fair. So yeah. I'm more than content with that approach. Yeah. Oh, OK. Um, right, we'll, we'll move on, Leanne, for the next session. It's pages 62 to 65. And the last session rightly had to, to last quite a bit of time given the submissions and we brought people together in one. I'm hoping the next two aren't quite as lengthy, but because uh, the, the written papers are are more distinct as well and shorter, so we'll, we'll, 
we'll do that. So pages 62 and 65, and just as they're, they're taking their seats, members, can I formally welcome um, David Smith, head of the Evangelical Alliance in Northern Ireland, and Don McAvoy, who also has worked in uh, Evangelical Alliance, to the meeting. You're both very welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Um, and again, as, as with the normal uh, sessions, this will be recorded by Hansard, and then it will be published um, on the committee web page in due course. So, David, I'm going to hand over to you. I think you're going to give an outline on your submission, and then we'll go straight to questions. Great. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Um, yes, I'm David Smith, head of the Evangelical Alliance in Northern Ireland. It's my pleasure to be here this morning. Um, thank you also for all that you're doing as our public representatives at this very difficult time uh, on these very pressing and urgent issues and on all the other issues. So genuinely thank you um, for all that you're doing on that. Um, one said to start that we are not experts on domestic violence. We don't claim to be. Um, we do speak into issues of human dignity. We believe that every person, young or old, male or female, and regardless of whatever identity markers we choose to uh, use for ourselves, that we carry infinite uh, worth and value as human beings. Uh, so I, I'd like to speak to the broad principles uh, and maybe, maybe some points that, that haven't been raised. And, and I know there's been uh, very detailed responses by lots of the women's groups around the statistics, and, and they know this area uh, better than I. But nothing here is to undermine or minimise abuse or mental health or manipulation or control. Um, and very broadly, we welcome the intention uh, of this bill to address the harmful behaviour not already captured under existing offences and to recognise those patterns of behaviour in law and to address those situations where uh, police are often maybe called and turn up and, and they fail to be able to um, do anything of substance potentially. Um, I would just raise the issue of definitions and, and the definition of harm. And I suppose just recognising that this bill doesn't come into uh, effect within a vacuum. And um, as people who engage in the public square at, at this time, um, recognising that there, there is potential, um, potential in this bill for a failure to maybe understand or appreciate different cultural or religious dynamics within a family or within a, a particular community. And um, we would not want, um, I suppose, there to be confusion or conflation of issues where there's genuine psychological coercion going on and where there's maybe misunderstanding of dynamics particular to a, a culture or a community or a family. Um, and, and we say that in, in a context where almost any idea can be deemed to be harmful um, by, by someone else, and there's a, a cancel culture um, quite quite prevalent at the moment. Um, sorry, I should have introduced my colleague Dawn, I'll let her do that properly her, her, herself, and, and I'll come to a point at which Dawn will speak to uh, more, more fully with her expertise. Also, just the, the word reckless in the bill, um, uh, just, just a concern, just flagging there, um, that I mean, we all have acted in ways that are reckless at times. Uh, behaviours or actions or words that are, are not wise or kind or good. I, I'm just asking the committee to consider how that is defined as differently to uh, a criminal offence and, and that threshold for criminal recklessness as opposed to uh, a, a character trait or a relationship um, that, that is not healthy or good but, but may fall below the bar of, of reckless or criminal. Um, and one, what we would say is in relationships, obviously, um, are, are core to how we do life as society together. And what's often missing and what legislation cannot often fail to address uh, or often fails to address is a work of grace in, in, in our hearts, our minds, and the quality of our relationships. So recognising there's a need for legislation, but it can only take us so far um, sometimes in the quality of the relationship. So we're, we're not concerned about the use of this legislation in genuine cases. We want to see vulnerable women, men, young people all protected from dangerous and abusive behaviours. However, if key terms are left undefined or, or there's a lack of safeguards to prevent malicious or vindictive use of it by either party in a toxic relationship, we would be concerned that the legislation itself could be abused and could end up losing trust or confidence in the public and, and genuine victims may, may uh, lose out in that. Um, 
I, I suppose if everything can be defined as harmful, a, a view that you disagree with, um, uh, that, that may not do um, victims um, much good. Also, just I suppose a point of clarification, I'm asking um, the committee, how, how could this legislation maybe be prevented from being conflated or confused with behaviour that is maybe unstable or, or immature or jealous or, or undesirable, but again is not necessarily criminal? Um, and could this be applied to instances maybe of bullying um, or where a friendship has gone sour and with young people or, or a premature relationship? Uh, uh, how, how will those thresholds, I suppose, for criminality be worked out, I suppose, is the, the question there. In a faith context, again, just aware that there's often faith illiteracy or cultural illiteracy. illiteracy. We don't understand those dynamics sometimes. I suppose asking could, um, if this was applied to a mentor-mentee relationship within a faith setting, a youth leader or a young person, um, and that youth leader being accused of a pattern of behaviour that was deemed reckless because of a failure to communicate something in particular, or in communicating certain teachings of that faith that were deemed to be harmful. So just thinking about in that faith setting, uh, we would talk about discipleship and um, accountability and, and growth. Um, and I'm wondering, could there be an unintended consequence um, around that? One other point I'd like to make just specifically um, before handing over to my colleague Don is just around the, the no right to, a, a claim, to claim a trial by jury. Um, I confess I'm a solicitor uh, from a previous life and um, I am just uh, I'm curious as to understand the rationale behind that. I, I, I presume it is because judiciary can be trained up and can um, understand more particularly the, the dynamics at play in these very complex cases uh, and that maybe getting a conviction from a jury is, is more, more difficult. But it does strike me that the only other example I can think of is potentially the Diplock courts and um, the, around terrorism where, where um, you are not allowed um, to be tried by, by a jury. And so just wondering um, if there is an issue here potentially around maintaining both actual and perceived access to justice and fairness, which again I think is important for confidence in this legislation so that it is effective and reaches those who need, it, need the protections in it the most. I'll hand over to Dong at this point um, to speak to an issue about coercion and abortion. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair and everyone else, for uh, inviting us to be here today. As David has said, my name is Dawn McAvoy. I am a researcher for the Evangelical Alliance in Northern Ireland, but I also head up the Both Lives Matter campaign that EA co-founded. I want to speak into the particular issue of coerced abortion within the context of the draft legislation. The government at Westminster has recently decriminalised abortion in Northern Ireland by repealing sections 58 and 59 of the Offences Against the Person Act 1861 and by amending section 25 of the 1945 Criminal Justice Act. As you will know, the 1861 Act provided legal protections for women in pregnancy <coughs> and for their pre-born babies up to the point of them being capable of life outside the womb, defined as 24 weeks, although now we know babies as young as 22 weeks are surviving. The offence of child destruction then protects the baby from the point of viability up to birth. A termination of pregnancy outside of the recently introduced legal framework for abortion does remain a criminal offence and there is an obligation on behalf of our legislators to ensure that those protections for women in pregnancy and their unborn children are provided. In addition, the UK as a party to the Istanbul Convention is required under Article 39 of that convention to ensure that abortion performed on a woman without her prior and informed consent or understanding is criminalised. Article 46 names as an aggravating circumstance a particular circumstance which makes a person vulnerable. Pregnancy would come under that clause. The draft bill that we're talking about today, while seeking to address in the broadest sense possible any and all behaviour which would or be likely to cause physical or psychological harm, including fear, alarm and distress, 
has not addressed specifically the state of pregnancy and the significant physical and psychological harm which may be caused to a woman when pregnant, including by forced or coerced abortion. Women's Aid, the largest charity offering life-saving support to women facing intimate partner violence and domestic abuse, and Best Beginnings, a charity which aims to give children the best possible start in life, have both stated clearly and publicly that 30% sorry, 30 of domestic violence starts or gets worse during pregnancy. 40 to 60% of women experiencing de domestic violence are abused whilst pregnant. More research does need to be carried out to provide comprehensive statistics for forced and coerced abortion. One national study in America estimated that up to 64% of women who aborted felt pressured to do so. And data reported by the Guttmacher Institute indicates that 30% of women have an abortion because someone else, not the woman, wants it. The draft legislation before us has been largely based on the Scottish legislation and evidence was given during their legislative process from a local charity working with women who have had abortions which cited a figure of 75% being bullied or pressurised into abortion. Before coming here today, I did a brief internet search for stories relating to assault in pregnancy because of pregnancy and designed to forcibly terminate that pregnancy. I would encourage you, if that's not the wrong word, to do the same. It was shockingly easy to find those stories and see and hear the horrific nature of those attacks. It is clear that forced and coerced abortions occur. It is evident that pregnancy can trigger and aggravate abuse. And it is both a moral and legal obligation for society to protect women from such behaviour. Women who have chosen to continue in their pregnancy deserve legal protection for their pregnancy. And that protection must also recognise the particular and significant harm done to them by the attempted or forced ending of their pregnancy. When a pregnancy is forcibly ended, there should be a recognition of what has been taken from that woman. Women deserve compassion and justice for the loss of their baby's life. And the criminal offence should, and any criminal offence, should reflect in its penalties the seriousness of what has been done to her. So the question is not whether this should be done. As I said, there's a legal and moral obligation. But how? I would want to ask you whether this committee will choose to deal with this specific and important issue in this bill. We would encourage you to grasp the opportunity to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Dawn, and thank you, David, um, for the, the presentation. Um, if I can pick up on some of the, the points um, that have been made. Uh, the, the, the definition of harm, David, that you had mentioned at the start, um, around recognising the cultural dynamic, relation, relational dynamic, and you made the point that any idea can be seen to do harm. And, and I'm trying to put this into the context, I suppose, of domestic abuse legislation, um, because obviously I, I've came off with ideas and people have said, no, that will be harmful. Um, uh, and, and therefore, you know, we'll always have public discourse about policies and, and so on, and, and, and that's what we should be doing in a free society, to be able to debate these things out without um, the, the accusation, I suppose, of harm being caused. But if, if I can bring it into the domestic environment, and I'm trying to just encapsulate what you're talking about, and I'll speak about my own home, because that's the safest thing to do, rather than talking about anyone else. Three daughters, and uh, seeking to, to guide them, advise them, um, in, in terms of how they're being brought up that of course now heading into the years that they are is becoming, starting to become a little bit more challenging. And so measures are time or taken to say, no, I'm not going to allow you to do that. I'm not allowing you to go there. Um, and, and you seek to try and develop those parameters to develop good behavior, I suppose. So in that context, is that where you're speaking about the cultural dynamic, relational dynamic, and what 
how you would define harm, that we need to be careful that we don't go so far that actually parents, for example, aren't able to provide guidance and at, at times that's going to mean challenging um, behaviours and, and what even young people that are growing up in your home that are thinking about. Um, yes, I think so, Paul. I think there is a specific um, exception around parents in the bill, um, but but that, that type of dynamic is exactly, I suppose, what I'm talking about. That, um, and, and again, just want to be very careful, not seeking to excuse any behaviour that is um, exploitative or manipulative or, or coercive in that way, but recognising oh. that in rela with relationship comes a degree of uh, honesty and accountability and um, rubbing up against each other sometimes and, and um, I wouldn't want um, a particular cultural context um, or um, religious context to be so misunderstood um, because no doubt we can look at lots of homes or, or dynamics and, and think something is harmful. I, I get that this legislation has to talk about harm, absolutely. I, I just would wonder about the bar for criminality and, and how that is um, ma maintained and, and so that people who, whose relationships may not be perfect uh, and may not actually be healthy <laughs> or particularly good, um, but, but may, not, may not be criminal, um, how, how the law or, or how the committee or, or the assembly will differentiate between that so as not to catch um, uh, and misunderstandings and cultural differences w within that. Yeah. Um, because obviously it, it, harm can manifest itself physically very obviously and that's an easy space to say that's wrong, of course it's wrong. It's whenever then people will indicate psychological harm or emotional harm. What does that mean in the context of the home and uh, all of those kind of dynamics that are at play? Um, and, and so I think in terms of how we define harm as well and it maybe leads me into the discipleship issue again i'll talk about me because that's the safest area to do it i'm involved in my own church i take a sunday school class um i have groups of young people um in third fourth and fifth form that i that i provide what you would call mentoring but i'm also teaching very clearly things that other people in society would fundamentally disagree with um, and indeed in, in teaching those beliefs, some will say that would be harmful. So where in the legislation do you see the concern that warrants what you've indicated yeah. about careful around discipleship and mentoring? I think the movement to personal connection and then the pattern being, I suppose, as little as two times. And again, there may be circumstances where that, that is absolutely appropriate and may result in a conviction um, on, on two times and um, a personal connection, but could that also be conflated or confused with genuine circumstances which a, a third party may perceive as being harmful or reckless in, in something that you've communicated or failed to communicate, to use again the words of the legislation. Uh, and so I suppose our experience, is, as I've said, um, it may not be in this particular area, but we are experiencing dealing with contentious issues in society, and we are often, I suppose, accused of holding or furthering views that are potentially harmful, um, according to someone else's view of the world. And so it's, we, we want a plural public square where people can have the freedom to articulate what they believe. And, and I would just be slightly nervous that some of that could be caught up um, within this, although that is not the intention of the legislation, and, and nothing we say is to undermine the very real circumstances that, we're, that this seeks to address. The, the, the comment there about the third party is an interesting one, because uh, you know, I will disagree fundamentally with some teachings in the Quran, for example, um, and I can look at other aspects of that kind of um, how you, you look through the world, the vision, the kind of way in which you, you look at it. And so it's making sure that this legislation doesn't interface in, in those kind of third party viewpoints, but where there's a direct correlation with that personal connection. That's what you're indicating is where this legislation should bite. Yes, yes. And I think our views would be would be shared with those from, from other faiths or, or from none. Um, uh, around some around some of these definitions of particularly harm and recklessness, um, when when applied to a criminal uh, a criminal threshold. 
the, the right to the claim for a trial by jury, that's something that I think you know, we'll, we'll want to pick up with the department just to see does this happen in, in any other aspects of cases to see if that is an area that's worth exploring with the department. Yes, and, and it just seemed unusual, but it's not a, it's not, I would just like to know more about that. I was just asking, I, I, the only example I could think of was sort of the terrorism um, example in the difficult courts, but I, I, I'm happy to be corrected around that. I just wasn't sure, so it seemed, seemed unusual. Um, it, it may be linked to the point of judicial training or jury training around these, because I know these are complex and, and difficult um, crimes to get a conviction around at times, so we, we want to see um, people brought to justice, but I, I just was curious around that, so I wanted to raise it, that, that was all. Okay. No, no, that's helpful. And Dawn, if I, if I can pick up then on the areas that you covered um, around what, what, what is in the Istanbul Convention and mm. the need to make it an offence in terms of where an abortion has taken place without the consent of the mother in, in respect of this. 30% in terms of the information that you, you've got there, the stats in terms of violence gets worse or starts at the point of pregnancy. Pretty shocking figure. All of these figures are, are disturbing and shocking, but 30% uh, starting at, at that point of pregnancy is something that I think um, really has stood out to me um, in, in respect of that, and 40% in terms of violence while pregnant in terms of domestic abuse as well, which are appalling figures. Um, in terms of looking at how this could be covered, I just wanted to get it in my mind. Th this isn't about, and it's a separate debate, the, the position around pro-life, pro-choice. Um, this is what you're talking about isn't part of that debate, which, which I have a clear view on, and obviously um, yourselves will and other members will have views on as well. This is abortion where the woman hasn't consented and has been forced, coerced into it. So there isn't a matter of pro-life, pro-choice in terms of this. It's around coercion. In terms of our, the obligations around the Istanbul Convention, can you just refer again to, you mentioned the, the relevant article um, and the, the convention and, and the, the responsibility for the UK government with respect of that? Article 39 talks about forced abortion and forced sterilisation and says parties shall take the necessary legislative or other measures to ensure that the following intentional conducts are criminalised performing an abortion on a woman without her prior and informed consent is point A. Article 40, 42 talks about an unacceptable justification for crimes, including crimes committed in the name of so-called honour. So um, pressure for abortions, perhaps sex selective abortions, or shame within a faith community. Um, so again, you're talking about uh, the context of vulnerable women in pregnancy. Um, in cultural circumstances. Article 46 then lists a series of aggravating circumstances and says parties shall take the necessary legislative or other measures to ensure that the following circumstances do not form part of the constituent elements of the offence. Um, and point C of those talks about an offence committed against a person who is made vulnerable by particular circumstances. So again, I would suggest that pregnancy, given the evidence, the statistical evidence about abuse because of pregnancy or during pregnancy, I would suggest that that would be an, an aggravated circumstance. Um, so those are all listed in the Istanbul, Istanbul Convention um, that the UK government is obliged to uh, bring into legislation. Now that has not happened as yet across the UK and it strikes me as sad and disturbing um, when you look at countries where abortion has been decriminalised then attempts to bring in exceptions so when you talked about pro-life, pro-choice, you're right, this isn't about pro-life, pro-choice. I would suggest this is about choice um, as opposed to being pro-abortion. And because in these circumstances specifically, these women have chosen to either be pregnant or continue in their pregnancy, and someone else is forcibly removing their choice, then there is no excuse 
on the grounds of a pro-choice stroke abortion argument to not deal with these offences and the, the, the ultimate um, need to criminalise such behaviour. And that takes me finally to the point then around um, making that then an offence and then reflecting the gravity of the nature of that offence, which is ending life. Um, has there been any thoughts as to, to where that offence should be? I know in other jurisdictions, Republic of Ireland, for example, 14 years would be the, the offence. Is there any thoughts in terms of what this should look like? Well, again, I suppose I would, I would say again, unlike David, I'm not legally trained, but looking at, yes, what is available and, of course, what was available under the law that has been removed, um, given the fact that you've got a woman who's chosen to be pregnant or continuing her pregnancy. So there's the harm done to her, aggravated by her pregnancy, and the loss of the life that she has recognised and wanted. So I would say whatever the sentence would be, it should be uh, significant to register the seriousness of the offence. And I would just maybe use an example of um, Canada, where uh, in 2014, within the context of us now being in a decriminalised um, scenario similar to Canada, in 2014, a young woman, Cassandra Kack, um, was assaulted. Uh, she was seven months pregnant, and she and her unborn daughter, Molly, they'd called her Molly, um, were killed. Under Canadian law, there was no recognition for Molly's life. Um, and Cassandra's mother and Molly's father solicited the help of their MP to bring in legislation specifically looking at forced abortion and actually referred to reckless behaviour, so potentially not even an intent to harm either mum or baby. And they failed to garner support because of concern by abortion activists that it would impact on the decriminalised elements of abortion. Um, so again, I suppose looking at examples of the lack of legislation and the lack of the <coughs> bill to legislate, but yet the legal requirement, I would again throw it back to our Department of Justice and encourage them to be creative in this, to acknowledge what changes have been made to the abortion framework, but this is about women who've chosen to be pregnant and they deserve that protection in law. No, that's been very helpful and very clear. Thank you, Dawn. Um, is that Paul through, Christine? Doug Bede. Uh, Chair, thank you. Um, uh, David, Dawn, thank you for that. I mean, it's been very, very clear, and, and, uh, and, and thanks for that. I guess, David, I, I mean, I'm very struck by what you've said. I think there's a, a real nuance to this that we really need to, to, to look at. Um, uh, and, and, I, and I think we do really need to, to, to delve into the harm and the recklessness piece in particular, because you're absolutely right. You know, people will perceive harm by something you say. We're actually, you know, we all come from a different era. We, we might not see it. So, so I am struck by that, and it has been mentioned before, I've got to say. So uh, I think it's something that we um, need to, to, to look into. I, I have to say, with the, with the evidence that's given, um, you know, the, the, the real headline is Chapter 5 and those four sentences, Dawn, that... that that we've just talked about, um, uh, and I'm very clear where you stand in regards to to abortion, and and it's difficult not to see this as an abortion issue, but an issue, in, you know, uh, about uh, domestic um, abuse. Um, and I and I guess that you know the Istanbul Convention is something the UK government are going to sign up to. They should have signed up to, and we're hoping they'll sign up to uh, in the future. Abortion law is completely CEDAW. Uh, compliant, uh, and the domestic abuse legislation has a clear piece on coercive control. So, you know, it's coercive control. Whether you want to narrow that down to abortion or whether you want to narrow it down to other forms of abuse, I guess it, it's, it's still there. But what strikes me with this uh, um, uh, non-physical abuse, coercion and, uh, and, and abortion is there's a mirror to this. And the mirror to that is non-physical abuse, coercion, stopping a woman from seeking an abortion, because we have the absolute opposite to this. Because we could have, very simply, a the same household, uh, which may have strong religious views, and the woman seeks to have an abortion 
but is stopped by her partner because of their religious views. That would be coercion as well. Um, so we have a real issue in regards to, to that. And in many ways, what we're talking about here is strengthening the abortion legislation. Because what that could actually lead to is that if a woman can prove before 12 weeks that she didn't have an abortion because she was coerced by her partner, she could take that to the courts in order to have the abortion after the 12 weeks. So there's a very mirror image to what you've said here in regards to that, and that is the coercion which stops women from accessing uh, an abortion. Could, do, you, do you see that? Don't you I, I absolutely see that, and I would just respectfully um, push back and refer to those statistics. So what I wouldn't want is for it to get into the quagmire about pro or against abortion. So I agree that there's a mirror aspect um, that the legislation then would provide cover for. But even though my position would be very different, I would not want for a woman who has chosen to be pregnant and continue her pregnancy not to have the legal protection, which, as you said, could be flipped to also then offer um, for a woman who's saying that she has been coerced into abortion. I don't believe that any woman should be coerced either way. I suppose that's what I'm saying. So we're, we're agreeing on that. My concern would be that, given the statistics about the relation between pregnancy and domestic violence, that the abortion issue makes it very muddy, and then the coercive element of the potential pressure to abort doesn't get resolved. And, 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 and Dawn, I, I, I get that. Uh, and I guess what I'm looking at is future-proofing everything. So we have a statistic now. What's that statistic going to be in five years' time? What's going to be in ten years' time? Now that we have, and we've never had it, now that we have abortion legislation, Will that mean that there will be more coercive control by partners in the future because their partner can access um, that, that, that abortion? So, so those figures are here and now, but they're not the figures in five or ten years' time. That could be we could flip this completely. Um, and, and I would contend that the legislation as it stands now is quite clear in my mind. If somebody is coercively trying to get somebody to have an abortion. That is absolutely against the law um, you know, and the legislation as it stands now. To me, the, the big question is if they managed to do that, if they managed to coerce them and they didn't have an abortion uh, and that became before the courts, it's the sentencing which would be the big thing for me. You know, that we have a stiff and strong enough sentencing because of the damage that was done on that coercion. But, but I have concerns if we try to put in a very bespoke piece which just talks about coerced abortion and not talking about coercion to stop women from accessing an abortion. No, whereas I'm happy, whereas I'm happy, sorry, don't, mm -hmm. where, I'm, where I'm happy now that this is covered in the legislation as it stands, I think it covers it as it stands uh, at this present moment in time. And you don't think there's a need to maybe specify pregnancy as an aggravating factor? I, I, I think there's, 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 there's lots of aggravating factors. I think we need to look at what aggravating factors are. I think we can look at look, many, many aggravating um, factors. Um, I, I think that's one of them. I think the seriousness of it is, is important. And that's a sentencing issue, and that's why I say it's a sentencing issue. But again, you know, the, women can suffer severe mental harm by having been forced to carry on with their pregnancy. That's another aggravating factor as well. So I guess what I'm trying to say, Dawn, I'm, 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 and, and I'm, I'm very conscious that we might come from different sides of the argument here. I'm just very conscious. Just but, very but con we're both reflecting a standard. It, it, so what it, you're exactly. saying, what I'm saying, is actually, so Istanbul talks about either coerced to not abort or coerced to abort. So actually what we're both saying, although we might differ on our views on abortion, is contained with the Istanbul, within the Istanbul Convention. So I suppose I'm suggesting possibly our own Department of Justice could, rather than wait for Westminster to deal with it, could address it specifically ourselves. So, so, so you're asking for a clause then, in, in essence, for uh, a, a coercive control in regards to abortion or denial of abortion? In, in uh, regard to pregnancy yeah. and then whatever that shape would take. To, to reflect the fact that, you know, having been pregnant four times myself um, and being quite ill with two of those pregnancies, that vulnerable category um, they, we've just recently been talking about perinatal mental health, um, antenatal mental health. So I think there is a particular category of vulnerability within women's state of pregnancy that I think could <coughs> be reflected in this bill and hasn't been yet.
and, and, and with, the error, with the mirror to it. Uh, and, the, and the reason I, I, I go into this, Don, because the reality is this will be the headline. This is what people will look at from, from your evidence, due, due respect, David. This is what people will look at from, from, from this. Um, you know, they, they will look at this piece of, 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 of what you're asking that should be put into it. But it's important that people understand that there is an absolute mirror to everything that you've said in here, and that is the coercion that stops women from accessing an abortion. And, and that's as equally as harmful uh, as, as what you've explained. But I think you've been very clear, and thank you for that. No, thank you, and I think it comes back down to definitions. Thank you. Linda? Thank you to both David and Don for your presentation. Um, just first of all, I suppose to David in relation to, to the warden. Um, I mean, I, I had mentioned earlier on we have the Bar Council coming next next week, but you've alluded to the fact that you come from the legal profession yourself. So, um, I mean, I think that they're, they're, you're rightly concerned about some of it, and it has been raised actually by other organisations as well that, that, that there should be some concern around it. I think we should ask the Bar Council next week as well, but, I mean, as you say, you have a legal background. I raised with one of the organisations that, that were speaking earlier that in relation to something that, something that they had raised around Clause 12, which was the, you know, the reasonableness um, defence. I think that we have to err on the side of the victims in this, in this bill. So whilst I accept, you know, for like the Attorney General used in, in terms of the reasonableness clause, the example of a young girl who was maybe mixing in crowds that her, her family weren't approving of having her phone removed or her access to car removed, which I think is reasonable. Um, that she could see that as harmful and report that. And, and whilst it will be extremely, I suppose, traumatic to a degree for anybody to be arrested in those circumstances, potentially, I think that it's much less traumatic than the incidents that we're dealing with. And we know that there is a, a like all the statistics sorry, there to show that there's a very low rate of reporting. But even when it's reported then, obviously, just like most violence against women, sexual violence as well, it making to court and, you know, actually getting through the process. And so this legislation is about trying to address some of those issues. Mm. So I accept what you're saying and I understand your concerns, but I still think we have to err on the side of, and I do think we should ask the Bar Council next week, I still think we have to err on the side of this the purpose of this legislation is about addressing the issue that we do not currently have legislation, we do not currently have enough protection for victims of domestic abuse. It's just not there. And everything that we see shows it. And the damage that that does to society, wider society, and you know, obviously if you work with families, you know all of this, is, is immeasurable. And, and I just think that we really need in this legislation to put things in place that, that will, will sufficiently give the tools in order for us to be able to get successful outcomes whenever it gets to a, a court and for the PSNA as well. Do you, do you, no, I, do you I, see even a, a, a way of wording it that would allow for both? Your concerns and, and my concerns to be addressed, or do you have any no, I, I, to that? I, I fully accept this is a very, this is dealing with a very complex area um, of non-physical, um, emotional sort of coercion and, and abuse. So, um, I, and there is a degree of subjectivity to that, and I fully accept that some victims will not see that they are victims of abuse. Um, and, and so this, this is complicated. I, I absolutely don't envy your role in this, so I want to be very careful. And, and I would actually agree that where, if in doubt, I would want to see victims protected, you know. Um, but I, I, I just want to raise that, um, you know, this, in this difficult space, I, I actually think what, what would be really helpful in terms of accompanying a bill like this is some sort of investment in relationships, education and prevention, uh, and the quality of relationships, um, because um, that's, that's what we want to see. We want to see relationships where people are treated with dignity, with humanity, um, uh, allowed to flourish within their own homes and their own friendships and communities. So um, I think, I suppose I'm always just cautious talking about legislation that impacts on 
um, personal relationships, I think the law can only take us so far in that. And then there's a degree of culture um, or preventing, pre preventing of measures that can be brought in. And I think the church and, and many others have a role to play in building good relationships across society. So I don't envy your role. I, th I think um, I would just be nervous about the criminalization of of someone who is potentially reckless. I, I've been reckless in the past in some of my words and some of my actions, no doubt. I think we all have been unwise in some of the things we may have said or done, particularly if it's a, if it's a new relationship or you're in the early stages or you're figuring someone out. Or, you know, I just think I've been nervous about um, that this being used to criminalize people who are maybe immature or actually just don't have the social skills or maybe have difficulty in communicating because of a um, some sort of, um, you know, social um, just ability that they don't have in, in their personality or in their capacity, and, and someone being criminalised around that um, would, would just be our, our concern. Just to say, I, I would have lacked concern in relation to all legislation, to be fair, and it, and it has been shown by the people who are in our presence that you're 100% you're right, and that's something that needs to be looked at and addressed. And there needs to be work done with the PPS in relation to that and, and understanding young people who have, I suppose, limited capacity. Yeah, and I, I recognise there's, you know, there are safeguards in place, the PPS, the, the two tests they use, the public interest and evidence and all. I, I think that's, a, that's an important counter maybe to some of this. They may turn up, see something that isn't good, but it's not criminal and it's, it's just around that area. That no, I, I absolutely agree with you on, on, on some of those issues, to, to be fair. So. Um, just then, in relation to Don, I, I suppose I'm in agreement with a lot of what I ha had just noted, some of the issues I wanted to raise, and I agree with, with a lot of what, what Doug has said around a specific provision in relation to abortion, because we could put specific provision then in relation to somebody who is forced to continue with the pregnancy. You talked about in the Istanbul um, Convention that the issue around forced sterilisation, so we could say, well, we need to go down that road. So I'm just wondering, what is it that you don't think is already provided for within the legislation as it currently sits? Because my understanding would be, I suppose, similar to yourself, Doug, in terms of that I would believe, and, and I actually accept all of the statistics you're giving us around the pregnancy, because it, it's out there, and all of the other organisations have highlighted the same issue. Um, and it would be a concern, you know, no, nobody wants to see that anyone would be forced to have an abortion by coercive control. And yes, that would be much more damaging than a, than a lot of other types of coercive control. But I don't see how it's not covered in the legislation as it sits. And, and maybe that's, maybe I'm not saying something that, that I should be saying, but I, I don't see it as it sits at the minute for me. What is there should absolutely protect a woman in pregnancy, Bo both sides of that, you know, whether she wants to continue with the pregnancy or whether she wants to end the pregnancy. So I would be concerned by putting the specific, I suppose, provision in because, Doug's right, that will become the issue. And this is domestic abuse. This is about domestic abuse. This is about protecting some of the most vulnerable people in our community suffering the, the most worst and heinous attacks in the very place where they should be most safe by the very people who are supposed to love them and protect them. So I want the headline to be around domestic abuse. I don't want it to be around, and you're right, this is not a pro-life, pro-choice argument. I, I absolutely agree with you on that, but it'll become that. It'll be, that will become the issue. So if it's not provided for in this and we do need to look at it, then fair enough, we need to look at it. But if it is provided for, why are we making an issue out of it in this bill? That, that, and that's my only concern around it. You know, I, again, I don't want to go get into the issue, and you're right not to get into that that element of it. But that's my concern. I, I just suppose I just want to highlight that and and, and put it to yourself, Don, as is is it necessary to have a specific provision, and if so, why? Well, I suppose I would respectfully push back and say, if it's not necessary, why does other why do other conventions raise it as an issue that should be addressed? And again, as I said to Doug, given the context of how prevalent abuse is due to pregnancy and because of pregnancy, um, then I would again say it's a sad state of affairs if because of 
an ideological perception or a cultural push for one um, law over another, that women who are in that vulnerable state aren't recognised as that making them particularly vulnerable and prone to being abused. And potentially it could come down to sentencing. Um, and again, what sentencing is in place, given the circumstances of being pregnant and the extra harm done to you because of that and potentially losing a wanted child. What, what sentencing can be put in place that would reflect the gravity of that abuse? And I mentioned 1861 because those sections were predominantly the legal offences in cases of being pregnant and losing a baby due to assault, an abortifacant, whatever that may be. So what other legislation is there in place? So if, if, I could be sh if we could be shown what the legislation is that reflects the gravity of that offence that would recognise what a woman has gone through and lost because of her pregnancy, then I think that's all that I'm asking for. And would the sentencing element, would that, would that be sufficient if, if there was something around the sentencing? Because I, I agree. That, well, well I mean, potentially, if, if it's a first offence, if it's only coming under assault, I don't mean that pejoratively. Yes. If it's, if it's coming under assault and if it's a first offence, it could be a fine. And given how a woman who has chosen to be pregnant would feel about that pregnancy and about that loss, um, then I would suggest that a fine doesn't recognise the harm that's been done to her. Thank you. Thank you. Paul Free. I've been cut out because I've had a couple of cutouts here uh, in the last 10, 15 minutes, so hopefully I stay online and you can hear me okay. Uh, I suppose my question is to Dawn. She raises a, a very important issue, uh, two issues in fact. So it's the vulnerability around pregnancy and a pregnant woman, and then the issue about the coercive, being coerced, coerced into an abortion. Uh, on that issue, on that latter issue first, uh, I think this is something that could unite um, the people uh, around the clause here on this because Surely even the people who class themselves as pro-choice will not want choice to be removed. So uh, I think that this is something we should look at. I think something that I certainly will look at uh, personally uh, to ensure that no one is, is forced to do something that they don't want, especially if it uh, takes away life. Uh, but my question to Dawn is, whilst it would be offence, could be an offence to force somebody to have an abortion, is there anything that we can place in legislation that you've looked at, Dawn, that can prevent the loss of life, uh, not just the deterrent of, of, a, of a criminal conviction after the event, but is there anything that we can do, place within the legislation that actually can prevent the act from taking place? i.e. the loss of life um, in, this, in this legislation? I, I think, um, thank you, Paul. It would come back to the, the point that David made, and I know that the legislation talks a lot about training and education, and I think um, particularly regarding male-female relationships, which domestic abuse primarily um, is about um, for the, statistically, I think it's a lot about relationship education, I think, um, and that includes information about what a pregnancy is, um, and for men to understand that it is wrong to abuse a woman, and understand that whenever she is pregnant, then there is another life there that must also be considered. Um, so I think it comes down to education, information, and training from school age up. Oh, come on. I'll come on to the, the pregnancy piece in a, in, a, in a wee minute, but can I just ask about, should there then be responsibility placed on, on providers, uh, training or questioning or questionnaires or surveys conducted 
to ensure that they are 100% sure that no one has been coerced into their facility or establishment. Yes, uh, sorry. And how would that then be legislated for? How, how could we get a term of words that would meet that? Um, David actually shared earlier that um, his wife's a midwife and already in antenatal classes, or sorry, antenatal appointments, um, women are asked privately whether um, their relationship is healthy. I'm not sure of the exact wording that is being used. So I think there are already examples of um, catching um, and uh, being prepared to respond effectively to cases where women are pregnant and there's potentially abuse there. When it comes to abortion clinics or providers, then I think there, yes, there should be parameters in place that um, confirm whether or not a woman is making an informed, free choice. And of course, recognising the, the wide range of um, circumstances that can lead to a woman feeling pressurised or bullied, um, or not feeling that she has a free choice to continue in her pregnancy. So there's a significant amount of work that could be done to ensure that it's genuinely about choice and not about being forced or coerced. Okay, and then on the on the pregnant the pregnancy piece and, and the vulnerability during pregnancy, uh, it strikes me, Dawn, and I don't know, I, I don't mean to bounce this on you, but I don't know if you've looked at Clause 9, which is the aggravation where relevant child is involved, and whether it would be neat and, and sufficient to add an amendment onto that clause, Clause 9, 1, where it says it may be specific, sorry, it may be specified as an allegation alongside a charge of a domestic abuse offence against a person A, that the offence is aggravated by reason of involving a relevant child. If you were to insert the words, uh, you know, and unborn child or children, and then of course you have all the other, you have all the other clauses, sub clauses to clause nine. Uh, and again, I haven't had time to go through them all to see if they neatly fit with relevant child or unborn child uh, amendment. But you could you could very easily, I think, insert the word the, the phrase unborn child to the like of clause nine, which could then help to safeguard and protect a pregnant woman during her pregnancy by simply putting in the word, the words or the phrases, uh, the phrase unborn child. Have you looked at that or is that something you could look at? Uh, I certainly will take a look at it now that this has been raised, but there's two, there's definitely two distinct issues here. There's someone been forced to have an abortion and then there's the woman's vulnerability when they're pregnant. Thank you. Yes, I think that's what I would feel most strongly, that there are two separate issues. There's the, the a special vulnerability because a woman is pregnant um, physically and mentally. Then there's the separate issue of the state of pregnancy being medically accurate to say that there are two lives at least. Now, regarding the wording, given the conversation that we've had here, I see the tension around that. And if the word child is going to be a red flag, Personally, I don't mind whether the word is embryo, fetus, child, using biological medical language, whatever that may be, but certainly recognising the presence, I think, would, would, yes, could be interesting for the committee and the department to look at. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks very much for your attendance. Thank you. Rachel Wage. Thank you. Um, I suppose just a comment, because obviously this has turned into... Um, bigger discussion on um, abortion um, than is in the submission, but um, before I move on to David with the specific example that you've used in the submission, and I would agree with um, much of the comments that have been made with Doug, by Doug and Linda on this, um, there's a wide range of behaviour and abusive relationships that impact on women's reproductive choices, and that includes causing of the pregnancy um, in the first place. 
such as rape or denial of access to contraception or contraception sabotage. So just on, on what we've been discussing, the UK government is implementing Istanbul Convention. We passed an LCM on this on Tuesday. It is therefore a matter for healthcare and for proper medical and clinical practice and guidance as it would do for other health matters. In terms of, of um, abortion services, and Paul mentioned this too, and it's already in place, as Don has mentioned, for information, the RQIA standards have already set processes in place to ensure that all women and girls seeking services for abortion do so voluntarily. That's already in place. So if there's a gap here, I think we need to look at that with the Committee for Health rather than in the Justice Bill. But in terms of all the things I've mentioned there and the LCM, is there an issue with the Istanbul Convention then? That it, does it not sufficiently cover vulnerability? And that's why you're seeking something in, in this bill? I think just on that, I, I think the reason what's changed, if we were sitting this time last year, um, what, what's changed is the removal of sections 58 and 59 of the 1861 Act that we believe protected both the woman and the unborn child from a coercive abortion. Uh, the attempt of that and the actual outcome of that, with that legislation now removed, that's the vacuum I think that we were seeking to raise within this. Um, by no means, uh, and, and I hear Doug's point and, and Linda's point, we don't want the headline about this to be uh, about abortion. I accept that that could be a consequence of it. We thought, however, given the vacuum, that, that that's what we did, but we want to be heard, I suppose, loud and clear, saying that the broad principles of this bill we, su we support. Um, there's a nuance that we want to bring to it, and uh, sorry, Don, you may have something else just on that, but to me it was the removal of the legislation in October last year that was prompting our, our um, we, we feel that there is a gap there um, that, that was previously covered around coercive control and, and abortion. Yeah, I don't think anybody could deny that there's a gap. You know, the previous law that has now been removed is what would be used, would have been used primarily in cases where a pregnant woman was assaulted and then had a miscarriage. Or abortion pills were slipped into her drink or yes, whatever it may be. Whatever that may be. So what we're saying is there is a gap in the legislation. Um, it's up to you whether you want to address the gap or not. Um, I'm not here denying any of the good parts of the draft bill that is before us. I'm merely seeking to address the gap that I, we saw. Um, it's not denying anything that you said um, around issues of reproductive rights and it was not my concern well, not my desire to turn this into an abortion conversation per se it's a desire to address the very real issue of domestic abuse related to pregnant women and the impact of that on the pregnant woman which could lead to her being forced to abort or miscarrying due to an assault so the legislation wherever it may be should be there to recognise that harm done to the woman. And I'm suggesting that it could be an element of this bill. Okay, so I appreciate that. But in terms of the, the gap, I just was have a problem just with the, with the gap, given that there are standards and regulations and practices in place medically, plus then the Istanbul Convention coming in through the Domestic Abuse Bill at Westminster. Would you still see a gap then? in our legislation here, given that the LCM that we passed on Tuesday covers Northern Ireland? Well, unless I'm not understanding, so I would ask you what the criminal offence is then? It's just, sorry, it's just, it's the, the gap that... Yeah, gap the, the, the Istanbul, Istanbul Convention is saying that there should be an, a criminal, a criminal offence for forced abortion. Yeah. You're saying with the Istanbul Convention being signed up to, that then there is no longer any gap. I'm then asking you what the criminal offence would be, because if there is a criminal offence, then, then that's fine. You know, I'm asking, is there a criminal offence which recognises forced abortion, coerced abortion? I'm not talking about forced birth or forced pregnancy. That conversation I said at the start, this is not about pro-abortion, pro-life. I'm respectfully asking, what legislation is there in place 
for if I was out today, pregnant, and was assaulted and lost my baby, there was a forced abortion. What legislation would protect me? You're saying there's no gap, and if there's not, that's wonderful, but what is the legislation? Because I genuinely don't know. No, the legislation hasn't come in yet. It's the domestic abuse bill is being looked at at Westminster, and anything re relevant to the LCA, the, the Istanbul Convention, will then automatically apply to Northern Ireland. So I'm not saying that there is legislation in place, but it's. It, I'm, what I'm trying to get at is the need for it specifically to be referenced in the Northern Ireland context whenever it's already coming in through Westminster. So I suppose so it's it would more automatically like, come into Northern Ireland when is, Westminster deals with it. I would just say, given the fact that we're always charged with dragging our heels, why would we not look at it in a way that is unique to our circumstances through our political representatives, who we've democratically elected to speak on our behalf and legislate for us? So if you're suggesting that you don't deal with it as a justice committee and let Westminster deal with it on our behalf, which I think is what you're saying, well, then that's, that's a decision for, for the committee to make. OK, um, I'll move on just to David, just on one point that you made. Um, and this is just about, uh, it's just something about a clarity. There were some examples given about a person discouraged from seeking help with anger issues if they were likely to be reported to the police and in terms of the mentor and youth leader, um, and it is accused of a reckless pattern of behaviour because of their failure to communicate or <coughs> communicating faith teachings deemed harmful. I'm just wanting to, if, if you could possibly elaborate on it, is there certain, faith, what faith teachings could be deemed as a course of abusive behaviour? Have you any examples on that, just, just well, for my interest? There is a movement towards defining, um, creating a new category of abuse called spiritual abuse. Um, so there's a direction of travel around that in GB. We would not be supportive of that. Abuse that happens within a faith context, if it is abuse, whether that's emotional, physical, sexual, whatever that is, we would like to see that dealt with as abuse, absolutely. But I think, again, back, back to the, the broader just context and culture that we live in, where someone's genuinely held orthodox beliefs can be deemed to be harmful by someone who does not share those and simply stating those beliefs or encouraging someone in those beliefs could be deemed to be um, a harmful uh, issue. So, I mean, there uh, could be lots of um, examples of that. The most contentious are likely to be around sexuality, around um, women's reproductive rights, as you might uh, call them. Um, so no, those types of issues are, are obviously going to be the most contentious as our, as our culture approaches. I, I think there's a potential here just for genuine misunderstandings about how different cultures or, or religious um, groups approach contentious issues, how they see the world completely differently. And so it, it, the, the heat often starts on a very controversial issue, but you need to take a huge step back to see how we actually see the meaning and purpose of life, the value in each other, family, community. It's a whole different way of seeing the world, not just seeing one issue. Uh, and that's where I would have some concerns around that. Uh, Ms. Woods. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, Linda. Just on a very quick point, David raised the education stuff earlier on, and that's a recurring theme, and we are going to deal with that. I just quickly want to come back to Dawn, I suppose, to, to take the, the, the stuff. I mean, if, if there is something that we need to look at around an unborn child dying as a result of domestic violence in terms of even what you talk about the assault then if that's something we need to look at then we should talk, speak to the department about it and look at it but I am concerned about the specific um, if it's around pregnancy that's different because that allows for all it allows for someone who's forced to carry through a pregnancy it allows for someone who is forced to end their pregnancy it allows for someone who is assaulted and as a result loses their baby I, I mean all of that is, I think, something I would find it hard to believe that nobody in this committee would be sympathetic to. So in terms of that, I think that is something that we, we certainly should bottom out. We should look at. We should see what 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 the issues are. Or is there some way of um, dealing with it? But I certainly would have an issue with the very specific reference to one element of pregnancy. And, and that, that would be, I suppose, where my concerns would be. But I do think we should look at it in the broader context. 
Thank you. Yeah, well, undoubtedly we're going to be, we're going to be looking at it, um, but we need to have all of the information to have a proper discussion. And I think members have raised rightly issues that we now need to consider. Does the LCM that was passed, for example, only this week, is that something that's going to cover what the Istanbul Convention is saying? And therefore, is Westminster going to legislate for exactly this issue? So, and and is there laws already in existence? So I do think we we are going to have to bottom all of that out and you've made your point very well and quite right to do so and I often find that you know, consensus often breeds bad law, better to have an engagement, a disagreement even and you tease out these issues uh, and then you can take decisions on an informed basis and you've done that very well. Sinead Bradley isn't here, she's had problems connecting online because of broadband issues, she is watching so she has sent a, a message <laughs> This is how we're now communicating um, <laughs> <laughs> through the, the, I don't know if this is the, the analog way, it's probably still digital, but um, to, to Christine, and I should have said it earlier, she wanted to put on record her thanks to the previous um, witnesses, but she, she does say in terms of your, your evidence, Dawn, um, that you've raised a direct question regarding pregnancy. And sadly, it is acknowledged that pregnancy can be a trigger for domestic abuse an important point which I believe the committee has a responsibility to give full consideration. The issue of coercive control around abortions is also well made. So I'm just I'm reading that into the record for Sinead's benefit. Um, and on that we'll conclude and, and thank you very much. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your thank time. You. Okay members, we're gonna keep moving on to the, the final evidence session then today. Can Thanks very much. Thank you. Right, thank you. Pages 67 to 72 of your meeting pack um, has the relevant information. It is, it's online. Okay. Um, so, Kendall is joining us um, through the Starley facility members. So, can I formally welcome uh, Kendall to the meeting and I, again as per the previous evidence session it will be recorded by Hansard and then it will be uh, published in due course so uh, Kendall is from the Migrant uh, Centre. So Kendall you're joining us through the audio facility so you're very welcome to the meeting and I'll hand over to you to, to give an outline um, briefly of your submission and then we'll move straight into to members questions. Thank you. Yes, can you can you all hear me? We can, yes. Okay, great. Sorry, I am fighting a losing battle with my Wi-Fi today, so apologies for no video. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, I just want to say thank you to the chair and committee um, on behalf of my center and I for inviting us to provide um, oral evidence regarding the domestic spill. Um, Migrant Center and I was created and it continues to be our mission to tackle racism in Northern Ireland and to advocate for the rights of migrant workers in Northern Ireland. Um, we would not specifically have um, kind of domestic abuse or women's support programs specifically. Um, I am going to be providing a level of analysis and kind of anecdotal evidence of what we have seen from our clients who maybe are accessing services um, for the services that we do provide, whether that's immigration advice or hand support, um, where, you know, we kind of have our ear to the ground and can see issues that come up facing vulnerable um, migrant and BME individuals and women in particular with regard to domestic abuse. Um, so I, um, you know, Migrant Center and I were very glad to introduce to this domestic abuse bill um, that is crucially important to understanding the dynamics. Did you know work faster? Kendall, can you hear us? We have we have dropped your your line. 
What is she? Is she? That's Paul. I wonder That's if Paul. She, uh, is she dialed in or is she doing it through the Wi Fi? He's away to make a cup of tea. A couple of minutes. <laughs> He's what? She's done. Make a cup of tea. Okay, yeah. members, we will tell you, we'll hold the candles. Oh, no, sir. Hi, uh, can you all hear me? Oh, she's like that, yes. Yes, and, and we have your your visual now this time, which is even better. Very, very sorry. Um, yeah, I'm just, just kind of, I lost the phone call, but managed to connect on here. Okay, well, listen. <laughs> so I'll just. We'll keep up where, where we were. Um, so with regard to coercive control and um, migrant and BME victims of domestic abuse, um, I, I just think it's important to highlight that um, migrant and BME individuals are at particular and unique risk for coercive control um, because of their individual circumstances, um, which can lend themselves to be leveraged by abusers uh, to further control and abuse um, the victims, whether that be emotionally or financially. Um, so these kinds of factors can include, for example, if a woman's being abused and she doesn't have um, English skills, right? So she depends on uh, her partner to, to kind of communicate and help her to navigate. Um, if her uh, visa or immigration status is kind of tenuous or uncertain or maybe undocumented. Um, you know, we've often seen where abusers have leveraged that against their victims um, as a means of controlling them. Um, just thinking about the level of impact that not having local connections has on victims as well, whereas, um, you know, at least hopefully if someone you know, grew up here, they have family here or friends or local connections that they can turn to for support. Um, you know, if a woman doesn't have that or if a victim doesn't have that, then they are at particular risk um, for isolation um, within the abusive relationship. So these are just some of the things to consider um, as far as why migrant and BME women specifically might be at particular risk of coercive control. Furthermore, um, elements, uh, kind of risk factors for coercive control that apply to women generally might be um, particularly severe, severe. For example, like an asylum seeker woman, um, for migrant work in, women working in um, precarious positions or maybe who, who aren't employed, where they don't have the level of financial independence um, to really be able to leave their abuser and feel secure that they can find secure accommodation immediately. These same things that apply to all victims of domestic abuse might be particularly pronounced um, in instances where it is migrant or um, minority ethnic women who are being abused. Um, I'm just going to share an anecdote, if that's all right, from my work um, you know, at the Migrant Center, because I think that it touches on a lot of these issues and also the recommendations that we would make. So for example, I am a volunteer at Women's Aid um, and you know, Women's Aid doesn't have a budget for interpreters. Um, and so even though I wasn't volunteering in an interpreting capacity, I would periodically be called in to do interpretation um, for women uh, who don't have the English skills to communicate in the drop-in clinic at Women's Aid. Um, and there was one woman in particular who was in a really dire and vulnerable situation um, where she was facing physical, emotional, and financial abuse and was no longer safe in her home and was entering emergency accommodation through Women's Aid. Um, so she goes into the refuge at Women's Aid, does not you know, is in a refuge or she's the only woman who really speaks her language. Um, you know, I, I was doing over the phone kind of emergency interpretation at points just because it's really a triage situation when the funding isn't there and you're dealing with vulnerable clients. Um, so I know just from, you know, having interpreted during her sessions in the drop-in clinic that, um, you know, they advised her, you know, okay, well, you'll need to go to 
um, the housing executive and kind of explain that you're coming from a domestic violence situation and are now having to present as homeless because of that, then it becomes, uh, you know, can you take a friend with you who not only can help interpret, um, because interpretation is one thing, but that can provide you know, a level of support as you're going through this very traumatic time um, and trying to navigate finding housing accommodation. <clears throat> um, so uh, at the Migrant Center, you know, due to lack of resources for many community organizations, like many community organizations, we share, we're very graciously hosted um, in our Belfast office, uh, using the office space of Balanify Community Development Agency, who have um, a benefits advice service. Um, just because we share an office, one of their benefits advice workers asked if I was able to interpret for a client that day. Um, and so I jumped in and did interpretation for him. Lo and behold, it was the same client that I was interpreting for at Women's Aid, who now at this point has been referred to another organization to assist with... Um, Benefits advice. Um, I know BCDA, as another small community organization, does not have an in house interpreter budget. You know, I was basically doing it in a volunteer capacity as well. Um, and luckily, I had the experience of one, having worked with this woman before, and have had the training and the experience as a women's aid volunteer. Because then at this point, it's interpreting services for a woman receiving benefits advice, but going through a very traumatic and stressful time and facing very particular circumstances where, you know, if you have just an interpreter alone that's not trained in issues of domestic abuse, um, then, you know, this client might feel like they're not being supported as well. And the level of knowledge of the system is just not there. You know, I had to explain because she was applying for disability benefits related to the abuse that she had experienced, the physical and mental abuse. She thought that she was coming in and that the, the advice worker doing the benefits at disability intake was, uh, you know, the doctor that was going to give her a prescription, like the level of knowledge about how to navigate the system just is not there. So imagine how difficult it is to navigate um, a new culture where you don't speak the language. And on top of that, you're dealing with serious trauma, escaping a domestic abuse situation. So I just bring up that anecdote because I think it really highlights a lot of the issues here. Um, and I should just add that, you know, this woman has never interfaced with the criminal justice system regarding her abuse, and she probably never will. Um, and that is the reality for many victims of abuse and even victims of abuse who do interface with the criminal justice system. Um, you know, it could be the best legislation that you could possibly get on the books. And if the level of uh, resources for organizations that support victims, um, for the PSNI, um, about getting information to victims, um, about, you know, who they can access and how they can access and what that looks like. Without a coordinated holistic effort, you know, the best legislation would all be for naught. And I just would refer to the, um, the precedent set by the report on serious sexual offenses in Northern Ireland by um, Judge Gillen, where, you know, an entire chapter is dedicated to the need um, for providing adequate resources to support victims of, um, you know, sexual crimes. Like, I would say that the exact same principles hold for victims of domestic abuse. And I know that Judge Marinin and his upcoming report is also going to be um, dedicating, you know, a portion of his review into the importance of resourcing as well, uh, because he's worked very closely with our hate crime victim advocates at the Migrant Center. So I'm echoing, you know, really things that have been said before by work commissioned by the Department of Justice, by the likes of Judge Gillen, to say that there's a need for the Department of Justice for law and policymakers to reach out to uniquely vulnerable groups, whether that be migrant asylum seekers or refugees, LGBTQ groups, which I commend you for doing here. Um, also groups dealing with, you know, p individuals who have disabilities, 
we desperately need empirical research commissioned by the government to learn the prevalence, extent, nature, and experiences of domestic abuse among these groups in particular. Consideration should be given to what procedures and mechanisms, including specialist domestic abuse services alone or in combination with conventional law and procedures in the legal system, uh, may establish a construct of victim justice for them in particular, um, given the uniquely vulnerable positions that they are in. <clears throat> As far as our recommendations kind of within the scope of, you know, working within the criminal justice system, which, you know, I worry may not be within the remit of the legislation themselves, but which the legislation will fail if these considerations are not taken into account, is the need for, um, prop first of all, properly resourced um, not only kind of on paper, but in practice in terms of interpreters, really not only for the PSNI, but also for the likes of, you know, the housing executive, the medical services, you know, client, clients will be told sometimes, yeah, we have interpreters or we have a telephone interpreting system. And in practice, maybe it's not, uh, it's not carried out as efficiently as, as one would hope. Um, and uh, in addition, that there needs to be a coordinated information campaign about how if women do want to access um, support from the police for instances of domestic abuse, how they would do that, um, and basically encouraging them to be able to do that, um, and that this would need to be a multilingual campaign um, kind of specifically and strategically targeted at um, ethnic minority communities as well, um, because they're, in addition to kind of the language barriers, there are real cultural barriers. Women, you know, especially, I mean, migrant women, refugee women, asylum seeker women certainly might be coming from cultures or from conflict situations where, you know, domestic abuse is not something that you go to the police for and they carry the residual attitude of that here. And obviously this isn't unprecedented for a lot of women in Northern Ireland. Unfortunately, this was the case until recently as well. Um, so using the, uh, the knowledge of the precedent for how you know, the great strides that the PSNI has taken to become more accessible um, in instances of sexual and domestic abuse crimes um, in Northern Ireland, how much that has improved and thinking, okay, how do we extend this to women coming from, from migrant backgrounds as well? Um, I, and, and I am echoing certainly my colleagues um, at uh, the Rainbow Project and here and I and Kara Friend who made excellent points about the need um, for outreach to vulnerable groups. I just want to echo those as well. Um, okay. And also to, we given the nature of um, kind of immigration status as a, uh, a factor in coercive control and a fact that deters women from actually interfacing with the criminal justice system, that... Um, there is categorically a ban on any sharing of information regarding victims of abuse um, within the criminal justice system with um, the home office and that the, that is actually enforced in practice. Um, I just wanna conclude by circling back to our point on the, the importance of resourcing, um, just to say that uh, again, echoing um, Gillen's sentiments in the Gillen review that the appropriate statutory agency should deliver a comprehensive resource impact assessment with the assistance of affected stakeholders into the recommendations made by affected groups um, and particularly vulnerable groups individually and cumulative, cumulatively. Um, this should include both the direct costs arising, for example, from the deployment of additional PSNI and PPS resources, and also indirect and consequential costs. For example, revisions required to the legal aid regime to support any enhanced services from counsel and solicitors at court. Um, I think that my colleagues at the Migrant Center who serve as hate crime victim advocates do a really great job of helping um, victims who uh, have been victims of race hate crime and might not have 
um, the English skills or might not have the cultural uh, kind of awareness of the criminal justice system here to navigate that in order to help them to try and find justice and healing after the very traumatic incidents of race hate crime that they've experienced. And I think that this might serve as some kind of precedent where um, there are liaisons either, you know, in organizations like Women's Aid or in organizations that deal specifically with these individual groups, um, but that certainly are able to act as liaisons between, or I should say, act as victim advocates um, for victims of domestic abuse, um, kind of as liaisons with PSNI um, that provide, you know, culturally competent um, support with the necessary language support as well. Um, I wanna thank you all for your time and I look forward to um, answering your questions to the best of my ability. Thank you, Kendall. And uh, you, you've covered the issues very well in your presentation and I very much appreciate that. In fact, uh, two of the questions that I have, you've, you've covered in, in good detail. It was around the uh, issue around sharing information with the Home Office. <laughs> Um, in, in, in respect of, of that, um, and I, I'm trying to think about how that can be dealt with in terms of the legislation um, and, and whether it can even be dealt with. Um, but if you want to just elaborate a little bit more on you know, why that is, is such an issue, I think it's probably stating the obvious, but just so I have it on the record. But um, have you any suggestion as to how that can be addressed? I just think any, any, first of all, any codification that makes it explicit um, that any, I, any victim of domestic abuse seeking, um, you know, to, who is taking the very difficult and brave decision of coming forward with that abuse, um, that they're not deterred from doing so out of fear um, that they will be jeopardizing their, um, you know, the, they, they'll be deported for coming forward with a crime or that they'll be somehow treated punitively with regard to their immigration status um, for doing so. Um, so I would just recommend any explicit codification kind of down the line, whether it's PSNI, whether it's the courts, whether it's the legal kind of representation that victims might be receiving, um, that there is an explicit ban on information sharing with the home office, you know, regarding the victims, uh, regarding anyone who's come forward as a victim of abuse. Okay, and in terms of the, the, the funding, um, the hate crime support partnership model that the police have with other organizations, is that one that you would like to see then replicated um, with, uh, in, in respect of domestic abuse? Because you, you've made the point well, we can have the, to quote, the best legislation on the books, but if it doesn't actually manifest itself uh, through uh, the support structures and education and so on, then it won't have the desired impact. Right, yeah, I do think that, you know, and not to say that it should necessarily be copied or replicated directly because it, it's its own issue and there are specific um, kind of things to take into account. But I do think the model of having specific victim supports, the way that the current hate crime kind of victim support liaisons are set up, it means that obviously the PSNI is very well trained in the intricacies of, you know, why and how hate crime happens. But the program was introduced for a reason and it I think from seeing the work that my colleagues do both in the migrant center and also at the other organizations um you know such as the rainbow project um that there was a clear need to say you know the psni is essentially saying we can't do this alone you know we need um specific and, or rather victims need specific support from support workers who understand the nuances and intricacies of why 
these victims are particularly vulnerable and know how to best support them. And in the case of the migrant center, there's the added kind of component of uh, the language barrier as well and the cultural barrier as well. Um, and, you know, I, I, I've seen this like working in the migrant sector before this, working in refugee resettlement, like we, we might not know where people are even coming from. Say someone comes from Nigeria, right? And they are experiencing uh, something as sensitive as domestic abuse. And this person is from one ethnic background and their interpreter is from another ethnic background in Nigeria, um, but they might speak the same language. Um, but, you know, is that person necessarily going to be uh, comfortable talking about something as intimate as what they're needing to discuss? You know, if, if, we're, not, if we're not aware of their specific cultural backgrounds and context and what they, in fact, might even have been escaping in their home countries, um, then, you know, we're not set up best to understand them versus if you have um, a victim support advocate who is well versed in the cultural components of what um, a victim might be facing as well, you know, I think that goes a long, long way in making victims feel supported and comfortable in, in proceeding with whatever they need to. Thank you. Um, Linda? Thank you very much, Kendall, for your presentation. And um, as the chair has said, much much of what I wanted to ask you has been well covered. So you definitely have given a very detailed um, account. I think probably one of the the big concerns for me is, is that is that bit that you're talking about around the advocacy and how how we get that put in place. And that's something that's been raised by other groups, even for advocates in general, because of the, the difficulties that we have around domestic abuse and, and obviously sexual violence as well. But so I think that, that that is something we should look at. And some of the issues you've raised today are very interesting, even in terms of... And it's something that's come up before, you know, around whenever we've had um, refugees coming here and, and people very kindly saying, I would take a family in, but not thinking through what that actually means for, for them, but also for the people that they're offering to take in, because there are certainly issues, you know, around cultural issues and and and, and all of that. So I think that it is something that we need to think through. And I mean, it's good for you to have presented us this morning and to remind us of all of those issues or this afternoon. Now. Um, just in terms of of the issue that the chair touched on around the Home Office, and not sharing that information. I would like us to find out some information on is that something that we can do? Is that something that we actually can enforce? Because obviously the issue around um, status is a reserve matter. It's not within our competence. Now, that, it may well be within our competence to, to decide not to share the information, but we need to find that out. I do think if it is possible, it's very important. It's, it's, it's a, a really positive move in, in terms of protecting women and victims of domestic abuse families you know goes, it obviously goes broader than women it's it's the children and, and the the wider family that can be involved in this as well so i would like that we could find that out if that is actually within our competence to do that and then the other issue which has been raised before kendall is the rather than about the status it's actually about the recourse to public funds can be a, a big issue so you know, there may be no issue around status, but there may well be an issue around recourse to public funds and therefore the the perpetrator can have entire control in that. Where do you go if you have yourself and also possibly children and no recourse to public funds? So I think that's something as well. And we had talked about, Chair, earlier how we would deal with some of those issues. That It mightn't be within the legislation, but something we need to deal with at a later stage. So those are things that, that I mean, I think we should be looking at in, in terms of your your presentation and the issues that you've raised for us. A lot of the other issues obviously are similar, but they're more complex when you're dealing with somebody who has the language barrier, the cultural barrier, and, and many other maybe difficulties as well in terms of, of access to funds and things like that. So just to thank you for your, your presentation, probably mine are just suggestions on how we can move forward rather than asking you questions, Kendall, because you've, you've, you've 
given quite a bit of detail there in relation to the issues that I, I'm raising. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Um, Rachel Woods. Yeah, thank you. Um, like Linda, most of my questions have either been answered um, by your submission and your account here today um, or in response to the chair. And I know there is a campaign ongoing at Westminster to try and get um, the issue of immigration status um, within their bill and with regard to the Home Office. And I would obviously support us looking to see if it is something within the competence of our Assembly that we could um, put into this bill as well and raised it with the Minister for Communities too. But just to tease out the need for a multilingual public information campaign, which I agree with, um, and you know, to communicate to victims that they can come forward. But are you aware of any precedent or other examples um, where this practice happens to encourage reporting and get, um, get people's support? Is there any other examples that go on at the moment that we could look at? You know, I don't have anything, you know, in front of me to reference, and it might be one of those situations where, you know, probably a bit of creative thinking and consultation with organizations like ourselves or like other organizations that would work closely with migrant and BME populations, um, I think should actually absolutely be brought on board for whatever the development of that campaign looks like. Um, so yeah, I, I don't have any examples in front of me, but I would just say that whatever does happen obviously should be done in consultation with members of the community themselves who are her best kind of the best experts on how to reach them. Yeah, absolutely agree. Certainly co-production guidance and, and communication and resources, um, certainly that needs to be, be done and that's been um, quite loud and clear in a number of submissions. So thank you for that. I, I would say that, you know, again, to point to the precedent of um, the hate crime kind of outreach that we would do, that obviously is a multilingual, we, we would have run a multilingual um, awareness campaign about that. Um, and so I'm thinking on our end, um, we would certainly kind of be, be maybe using that as a bit of a precedent. But again, I don't want to just say, you know, it's copy paste, you just replicate it because there are certain considerations um, with this, this particular topic, like for example, um, there would, like this information would need to be available in women's refuges, um, among other things. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Okay, members, there's no other points just to be raised in this. Kendall, you, you did cover everything very well in your, your presentation at the start, so I appreciate that, and I want to thank you for contribution that you've made to the committee's evidence session and wish you well. Thank you very much. Thank you all for um, for giving me the time to speak today. I really appreciate it. Pleasure, Kendall. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members. Um, moving swiftly on then. There's, I, I have no chairman's business. Or, well, sorry. I do. I see that. Um, is there any other business, first of all? No. Um, the date and time of our next meeting then is next Tuesday at 1pm. Uh, and we're going to have a very brief discussion in closed session, so we'll, we'll, we'll move to that now. Is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30? This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.